Good evening. This is Chairwoman Tiara Booker Dwyer. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, April 16, 2024. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Ms. Kayla Drummond. We will then have a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being broadcast through the BCPS online live meeting broadcast and on BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, and Verizon Files Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is consideration of the April 16th agenda. Dr. Rogers, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I am unaware of any additions or changes to this evening's agenda. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Consult with counsel to obtain legal advice and consult with staff, consultants, or other individuals about pending or potential litigation. The closed session summary and the open session information summary can be found on board docs under this board, meet, uh, board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters, and for that I call on Mr. McCall. Good evening, Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, Superintendent Dr. Rogers, and members of the board. I'd like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, non-renewals, deceased recognition of service, and certificated appointments. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D1 through D5? So moved, Prim Paul. Do I have a second? Second, Stileski. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Stileski? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Frempal? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank Motion you. carries. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that I call on Dr. Rogers. Good evening, Madam Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, and members of the board. I'm bringing forward the following administrative appointment for your approval. Director, Community Schools, Office of Title I. Coordinator, Health Education, Office of Health and Physical Education. Coordinator, Title I School Support, Office of Title I. Staff Attorney, Transactions, Office of Law. Specialist, Advanced Academics. Specialist, Dance and Theater. Specialist, two positions for elementary English language arts. Specialist, elementary computer science and science technology, engineering, art, and math. Specialist, two positions for instructional and educational technology, Office of Library Programs and Educational Technology. Specialist, Northeast Infants and Toddlers. Specialist, mathematics, two positions. Specialist, preschool services. Specialist Science, two positions, Specialist Secondary English Language Arts, Specialist Secondary Literacy, Specialist Social Studies, two positions, S School Program Specialist, Office of Title I, two positions, Specialist World Languages, and two positions, Senior Community School Facilitator, Office of Title I. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in Exhibit E1? So moved, Harvey. Do I have a second? 
Second from Pong. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Stileski? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Our first appointment this evening is Sarah Bennett. Sarah, please stand. Sarah is attending this evening with her husband, Sam Bennett. We'll give him a round of applause. Sarah is being appointed as the Senior Community School Facilitator in the Office of Title I. With five years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, her previous experiences include English teacher at Towson High and Perry Hall Middle Schools and Community School Facilitator at Riverview Elementary School. Her previous experiences prior to that include language arts teacher in Anne Arundel County Public Schools. Congratulations. Okay, the technology is catching up. We'll move to our second appointment. Sharon Brown. There we go. Sharon, please stand. Sharon is being appointed as the specialist of mathematics with 27 years of experience of service with Baltimore County Public Schools. Her previous experiences include special education, self-contained teacher, classroom teacher, stat teacher at Oliver Beach Elementary School, special education and self-contained teacher at Hale Thorpe Elementary School, and resource teacher in the Office of Mathematics. Congratulations. Next appointment is Tiffany Cole. <laughs> Tiffany is attending this evening with her husband, D'Angelo Frazier, and is being appointed as the coordinator, Title I School Support, in the Office of Title I. With two years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, her previous experience includes specialist and supervisor in the Office of Title I. Her previous experiences include Principal, Educational Associate, Targeted Assistant School Intervention Teacher, Title I Specialist, and Instructional Support Teacher in Baltimore City Public Schools. Congratulations. Our next appointment is Amanda Cook. Amanda is attending this evening with her husband, Matthew Cook, and and is being appointed as the specialist elementary English language arts in the Office of English Language Arts. With 13 years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, her previous experiences include classroom teacher at Arbutus Elementary and Honeygo Elementary Schools, reading specialist at Perry Hall Elementary and Shady Spring Elementary Schools, and resource teacher in the Office of English Language Arts. Congratulations. Our next appointment is Melissa Forster. <laughs> Melissa is attending this evening and is being appointed, appointed as the Director of Community Schools in the Office of Title I. With 13 years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, her previous experiences include classroom teacher at Bedford Elementary School, resource teacher in the Office of English Language Arts, specialist for homeless education, and coordinator for community schools in the Office of Title I. Her previous experiences prior to that include intervention teacher in Carroll County Public Schools. Congratulations. Our next appointment is Jessica Hankin. Jessica is attending this evening with her husband, Aaron, and is being appointed as the Specialist Preschool Services Office of Birth to Five. With three years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, her previous experience includes resource teacher in the Office of Teaching and Learning. Her previous experiences prior to that include research assistant and curriculum instruction and assessment specialist at Kennedy Krieger Institute and coordinator for early learning programs in Baltimore City Public Schools. Congratulations and welcome back to BCPS. <laughs> Next appointment this evening is Madiwa Johnson. She 
She is attending this evening with her husband, Sean Betts, and is being appointed as the school program specialist in the office of Title I. With 17 years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, her previous experiences include business education teacher at Milford Mill Academy, Franklin High, Overly High Schools, and career research and development teacher at Overly High School. Congratulations. Next appointment is Kelsey Kelly. Kelsey is attending this evening with her husband, Travis Kelsey. Tra excuse me, Travis Kelly. <laughs> I tried. Travis Kelly and is being appointed as the Specialist Secondary Literacy in the Office of English Language Arts. With five years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, her previous experiences include reading teacher at Stemmers Run Middle School and English teacher at Dundalk Middle School. Prior to that, she was a classroom teacher in Hartford County Public Schools. Congratulations. Our next appointment is Carrie Lockery. Carrie is attending this evening with her husband, Sean, and is being appointed as the Specialist Secondary English Language Arts in the Office of English Language Arts. With 15 years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, her prior experiences include English teacher at Crossroads Center, Parkville High School, and Dundalk High School, special education inclusion teacher at Parkville High School, and resource teacher in the Office of English Language Arts. Congratulations. Kareline Lubin. <laughs> Kareline is attending this evening with her fiance, William Freeman, and is being appointed as a specialist, World Languages in the Office of World Language, with 20 years of 28 years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools. Her previous experiences include French teacher at Golden Ring Middle School, Spanish teacher at Lock Raven Technical Academy in Towson High School, and resource teacher in the Office of World Languages. Congratulations. <laughs> Daryl Pilot <laughs> is attending this evening and is being appointed as the specialist to dance and theater in the Office of Performing Arts. With almost two years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, prior experiences include resource teacher in the Office of Performing Arts. Previous experiences prior to that include dance teacher in Prince George's County Public Schools, Somerset Independent School District, and Arlington Independent School District, and ESL lead teacher in Cleburne Independent School District. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next appointment is Christine Pipkin. <laughs> Christine is attending this evening with her husband, Jason Pipkin, and is being appointed as the Specialist Instruction and Education Technology in the Office of Library Media Programs and Education Technology. With 10 years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, Christine's BCPS experiences include classroom teacher at Logan Elementary School, reading teacher and mathematics teacher at Parkville Middle School, stat teacher at Pine Grove Middle School, and resource teacher in the Office of Innovation and Digital Safety and Technology. Her prior experiences before that include classroom teacher in Harford County Public Schools. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next appointment is Mia Plume. She is attending this evening with her husband, Brian, and is being appointed as the school program specialist in the office of Title I. With 17 years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, Mia's BCPS experiences include reading teacher, resource teacher, stat teacher, and staff development teacher at Woodlawn Middle School, and resource teacher at Wellwood International. Congratulations. Next appointment this evening is Shannon Rayfield. <laughs> Shannon is, is attending this evening with her husband, Raymond, 
and is being appointed as the staff attorney transactions in the Office of Law. Her experiences include managing attorney at Greenspring Title Company, director of title operations at CFE Settlements, in-house counsel at Gateway Title Group, default serving real estate attorney at Alba Law Group, partner corporate counsel at Colling Scanlon, senior attorney at Orleans PC, attorney at Greenspan Mar Martyr, and assistant attorney general with the state of Maryland. Congratulations and welcome to BCPS. She's ready. Our next appointment is David Robinson. <laughs> David is attending this evening and is being appointed as the specialist secondary English language arts in the Office of English Language Arts. With six years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, his prior experiences include English teacher at Randallstown High School and resource teacher in the Office of English Language Arts. Prior to that, he was a full-time instructor at Marshall University. Congratulations. Kirsten Roller. Kirsten is attending this evening with her husband, Scott Roller, and is being appointed as the coordinator, health education, in the Office of Health and Physical Education. With 16 years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, her prior experiences include health teacher at Kenwood High School and Middle River Middle School, supervisor, health education in the Office of Health and Physical Education. Prior to that, she served as the assistant director of health education and promotion at Towson University and health education specialist at the Maryland State Department of Education. Congratulations. Our next appointment is Valerie Schaefer. Valerie is attending this evening with her husband, Rick, and is being appointed as the Specialist Instructional and Educational Technology in the Office of Library, Media Programs, and Educational Technology. With 18 years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, her prior experiences include classroom teacher at Scott Branch Elementary and Dogwood Elementary Schools, technology integration teacher at Scott Branch Elementary School, and resource teacher in the Office of Innovation and Digital Safety. Congratulations. Our next appointment is Lachelle Wallace. Michelle is attending this evening with her husband, Antonio, and is being appointed as the specialist Northeast Infants and Toddlers in the Office of Birth Through Five. With six years of experiences in Baltimore County, her prior experiences include special education inclusion teacher at Millbrook Elementary and Southwest Infants and Toddlers, Infants and Toddlers teacher at Southwest, and team leader Infants and Toddlers in the Office of Birth to Five. Congratulations. Next appointment is Jennifer Weaver. <laughs> Jennifer is attending this evening with her husband, Robert Weaver, and is being appointed as the specialist, elementary computer science and science technology, engineering, art, and math in the Office of Career Technology, Education, and Fine Arts. With 21 years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, her prior experiences include technology education teacher at Sudbrook Magnet Middle and Windsor Mill Middle Schools, art teacher at Middle River Middle School, and resource teacher in the Office of Science, Health, and Physical Education. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next appointment is Gary Werner. Gary is attending this evening with his wife, Lori, and is being appointed as the specialist science in the Office of Science. With 17 years of, ex of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, his prior experiences include classroom teacher at Gunpowder Elementary and resource teacher in the Office of Science. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next appointment is Dominique Willis. 
Dominique is attending this evening with her mother, Portia Willis, and is being appointed as the Senior Community School Facilitator in the Office of Title I. With two years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, her prior experience include Community School Facilitator at Halstead Academy. Her previous experiences include Community School Coordinator in Baltimore City Public Schools and Program Manager at Community Law in Action. Congratulations. Next appointment for this evening is Treasurer Zimmerman. <laughs> Treasurer is attending this evening with her son, Drew. Drew. And is being appointed as the Specialist Elementary English Language Arts in the Office of English Language Arts with 23 years of experience with, in Baltimore County Public Schools. Her previous service includes classroom teacher at Hernwood Elementary, Cedarmere Elementary, and Franklin Elementary Schools, reading specialist at Campfield Education Center, special education self-contained teacher, and reading specialist at Franklin Elementary School, and resource teacher in the Office of English Language Arts. Congratulations. Our next appointment for the evening is Teresa Flaspolar. Teresa is being appointed as the Specialist Social Studies in the Office of Social Studies with eight years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools. Her previous experiences include classroom teacher at Pinewood Elementary School. Prior to that, she served as a junior high Spanish exploratory teacher in Melville School District, a math teacher and multi-age teacher in Port Townsend School District, and an English teacher at Saigon South International School. Congratulations to Teresa. Our next appointment is Robin Hallie Brillante. She is being appointed as the Specialist Advanced Academics in the Office of Advanced Academics with 29 years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools. Her prior experiences include middle school teacher at Middle River Middle and Deep Creek Middle Schools, English teacher at Pikesville Middle, Deep Creek Middle, Dumbarton Middle, and Northwest Academy of Health Sciences, and resource teacher in the Office of Title I and Advanced Academics. Congratulations to Robin. Next appointment is Jennifer Meehan. Jennifer is being appointed as the Specialist to Social Studies in the Office of Social Studies with 29 years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools. Her previous experiences include English teacher at Chesapeake High and Overly High Schools, reading teacher at Towson High School, and resource teacher in the Office of Advanced Academics and Social Studies. Congratulations to Jennifer. And we made it. Our final appointment of the evening is Nicholas Pizik. He's being appointed as the Specialist Mathematics in the Office of Mathematics with seven years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools. Previous experiences include classroom teacher at Logan Elementary School and resource teacher in the Office of Mathematics. Nicholas' previous experiences prior to that include classroom teacher and mathematics interventionist and specialist in Frederick County Public Schools. Congratulations to Nicholas and all of our appointments this evening. In case everyone has not noted, has not, has not had an opportunity to notice, hiring season is officially started in Baltimore County Public Schools. We are uh, truly grateful to our recruitment and staffing team, as well as to the Division of Curriculum and Instruction, who got it started this evening. Thank you to all. This was absolutely wonderful. Congratulations to all of the people who got promoted. Could we just have you all stand again and let's give you all one more round of applause. Look at this, this is wonderful. Thank you, we are expecting big things from you in Baltimore County Public Schools. So our next agenda item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. If not selected to address the board, members of the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. The Baltimore County Police Department's Homeland Security Unit and Office of School Safety has recommended safety and security protocols which are posted in the boardroom and available in board docs and on the board's participation by the public website. 
While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. Inappropriate personal remarks or other behaviors such as language that promotes violence against a PCPS employee or that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of the meeting are out of order and will not be tolerated. Persons who otherwise disrupt or disturb this meeting will not be allowed to continue their remarks and will be escorted from the meeting. Please observe the three minute clock when, which will let you know when your time is up. The microphone will be turned off at the discretion of the board chair. So I now call on school system affiliated groups to speak. Our first speaker is Ms. Leslie Weber for the PTA counts from the PTA Council of Baltimore County. Good evening, Chair Booker Dwyer, <clears throat> Vice Chair Pumphrey, Board of Education members, and Dr. Rogers. It's been a long time since I've spoken, so I'm happy to be here tonight. <clears throat> PTA Council has been very busy, sorry. <clears throat> Sorry, PTA Council has been very busy, as always, supporting the nearly 130 PTA units in BCPS. Thanks in large part to the work of Emory Young, we've recently restarted the PTAs at Halstead Academy and Parkville High School. We've been working to get units where they need to be in terms of free state PTA, state, and IRS requirements. It's hard running a nonprofit corporation, and all officers who stepped up, step up to do this work need to be commended. In addition to holding council elections, we'll hold compliance workshops at our April 25th general meeting. Our March general meeting fo focused on health and safety. We had great BCPS presentations on social media use and BCPS meal improvements. And from the Sierra Club, we heard about the dangers of AstroTurf. Our Health and Safety Committee Chair, Andrew Broadwater, will speak more about these topics at an upcoming Board of Ed meeting. I was grateful to speak to community school facilitators at their late January professional development. Many have reached out about increasing family engagement at their schools by restarting their PTA units. I spoke at the Randallstown NAACP's March general meeting about PTA and family engagement. It was a great community event focused on education. Ms. Booker Dwyer and Ms. Pumphrey attended, and I'm sure they took a lot away from it, as I did. We're grateful to be part of the Baltimore County Education Justice Table, a new coalition focused on protecting and improving our public, public education system. The first stop in the table's whole communities, whole students tour will be at Dundalk Middle on April 30th at 6 p.m. All ages are invited. There will be open discussions, free food, and activities. Thank you to Dr. Rogers and Ms. Charlie Green for continuing to take part in leadership roundtables with PTA presidents and the council. Thanks to Sue Hahn from the Office of Family and Community Engagement for facilitating these sessions. We plan to have the last session of the year on May 2nd. Finally, thank you to our Reflections Committee Chair, Hope Metzler, for running our Reflections program again this year. Reflections is National PTA's signature arts program. Nearly 300,000 students across the country take part in it. Our ceremony took place on April 7th, and it was wonderful to see students, families, administrators, art teachers, and PTA leaders gather to celebrate the students' outstanding artwork. The program is only possible due to the hard work of Reflections Committee Chairs at local PTA units. BCPS students did very well at the state level, and the work of two students will go on to be judged at the national level. The plan is for Hope to speak at the next Board of Ed meeting about this program and the winners. Thank you. Thank you. Next are our unions, and our first speaker is Mr. Billy Burke speaking on behalf of CASE. Good evening, Chairwoman, Ms. Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair, Mrs. Pumphrey, Superintendent Dr. Rogers, and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight on behalf of CASE. I would like to address two items this evening. Item one is a request to update and improve the policies for technology use. The policies need to include language that explicitly addresses misrepresenting BCPS staff using technology and or social media platforms. Staff need protection from defamation, harassment, and threats. Current processes consider case members, specifically school administrators, as public fig figures that are subject to public criticism, and so the system is reluctant to take legal action. I'm not talking about criticism. 
I'm talking about lies and misrepresentation of the ideas, thoughts, and actions of staff. The lack of response from BCPS contributes to the toxic work conditions and lack of morale. Clear policies that identify the consequences to the school community for misusing technology to misrepresent, defame, threaten, and harass staff would provide protection and, more importantly, show that BCPS values its employees. Item two is a request for greater transparency when implementing actions that affect the employment status of staff. We were informed that staff would need to be reassigned in order to reduce the number of staff in central office to support the budget deficit. We were not informed that those reassignments would result in the demotion of over 10 case members. Demotions usually occur for underperformance. I have never seen a demotion happen in order to support the budget. Because the new organizational structure had not been discussed or approved, staff and supervisors could provide little to no support to those members affected by the demotions. The affected members received letters that said their positions had been eliminated, but a different position had been saved for them. I understand that language was meant to be comforting, but when it was revealed that it would be a demotion, it was disingenuous and scary. The demotions resulted in a $12,000 to $15,000 pay cut for those affected. I can't explain to affected members why they can no longer afford child care or the college tuition they had planned for because the reassignments don't violate the master agreement. The action may be legal, but it doesn't speak to supporting staff. I have asked staff to continue to review current openings and provide staff with any appropriate lateral moves to get staff back to their current pay status. I've also asked staff to consider maintaining current salaries so the affected staff can make the appropriate life adjustments. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of CASE. Thank you. Next are our individual citizens and student group. And our first speaker is Ms. Rita Ridgely. Our next speaker is Ms. Sharon Seroff. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Over the course of this year, I know you have heard me speak about special education. And today I'm coming to you because we need to take a drastic look at how BCPS is doing special education. Special education is providing specialized instruction to a child with a disability. There is nothing in the law that says that child with a disability has to be functioning below grade level. So that means that if a child who is gifted needs specialized instruction, that's something that needs to be provided. Special education is not a one-size-fits-all, and I'm seeing a lot of that this year in particular in Baltimore County Public Schools. We do not dump students into a general education classroom without support and expect them to be successful, get their good grades. If we don't give them the supports that they need, they are not going to succeed, whether they are below grade level or above grade level. Special education is not putting a child on a computer program for an hour to 90 minutes and not providing them instruction. I am seeing that in many schools, particularly in middle and high schools, where we're next year increasing class size. Special education is not placing a child in a classroom with untrained staff. Again, I am seeing that to the point where I am seeing children come home with injuries. That is not acceptable. We need to take a drastic look at what special education is supposed to be. And in order to do that, 
we need to be creative, we need to be open-minded, and we need to see what that child's needs are and be willing to communicate and collaborate with parents and other professionals who do not work with the county. That is not happening. And if we are going to make special education a priority, that has to happen. We need a change in this county because otherwise special education is going to go downhill faster than what it's doing right now. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Serov. Next, we have Ms. Claudia Enders. Good evening. I'm Claudia Enders from Charlesmont Elementary. I'm a special educator working with our youngest learners in schools. I'm deeply concerned about the support staff that work in these preschool, pre-K, self-contained classrooms who play a crucial role in the success of these students. Specifically, I'm referring to our additional adult support and our early intervention assistants who work closely with my students in the classroom. Many of our students face challenges in expressing themselves through verbal words, simple signing, or core words. When they experience frustration, they often resort to behaviors like biting, scratching, or throwing toys. These behaviors can be difficult to manage, and without the support of our dedicated adult assistants and our EIAs in our room, um, it can become very chaotic and hectic. In addition to providing behavioral support, these adults also assist with tasks such as changing diapers and wiping noses. It's important to recognize the value role they play in maintaining a safe and supportive learning environment for our students. It's important to find time and money to prepare them with the specific training to work with these students, especially as we look forward towards creating inclusive classrooms and schools. Um, I also want to highlight the challenges these hardworking BCPS employees face particularly this year. Many of them are single adults who are raising children of their own. Despite their dedication and hard work, they have faced financial difficulties because they are not being paid during holidays, days off, or teacher professional days. Some of them did not receive full paychecks until January, which was very hard for them. Um, I firmly believe that these employees deserve to be compensated for the work they do, including these days when schools is not in session. It's essential to ensure that they are supported fairly with compensating them and their commitment to our students and well-being in their education. Without these ladies, I cannot tell you how much I rely on them to help me with my kids. They love them as much as I do. They take they're so patient and they're, they're willing to learn and they're willing to do whatever to help my students succeed. And they rejoice and celebrate with every word that we hear for the first time from these little people. And it's amazing. But I know financially these days off, I look forward to them and for them it's just a hardship. Um, and without them we can't function. And without them in my room, I, the days that they're gone, it, you definitely can feel it and kids can get hurt in my room and things like that. And I just. I just want to advocate for them and, and have a voice for them since they don't belong to any union. Just the vitality of them in our schools. So thank you so much. Thank you. Next we have Ms. Miram Gonzalez. All right, next we have Dr. Bosch Ferrone. Good evening to all. Sharon said open-minded. I ask you to be open-minded. Just consider my thought. I saw the bridge coming down, and it was a shock to me like many other people. That bridge was part of my growing up in Baltimore even before it was built. I used to go there to the end just really to watch the water and the birds. And if you see our elected officials, honorable elected officials come in to the bridge and promising 
quick resolution, quick funding, building it again better and quicker. I was really impressed of that. So what came to my mind is that the school system has been underfunded for 25 years that I have been involved with. I've seen it. I am really honestly a true witness. And it's this, uh, the same. So the issue of the bridge is about jobs, about money, about Amazon, about automobiles coming in and going out. The issue about students is that we train and educate students to be the future engines of the society, the leaders of this country locally and nationally. I think officials need to be as committed to public education as they were taking a photo opportunity with the bridge behind them. So I want to quote Horace Mann, if you know him. I really love that man, and I love reading about him. In the 1700s, I believe he was the first superintendent, first, I think, secretary of education. That's about 300 years ago. And he was a strong believer in public education to be free. Well, it is free today. Universal, I'm not really sure about that. Non-sectarian, I really don't believe that's present, and staffed with highly qualified teachers. 300 years ago, he was talking about very similar problems that we still have here. So I know you monitor what happens in Annapolis. I basically encourage you to think of what I'm saying and advocate for our public officials to fund the school adequately all around, not just buildings, not just bonuses, adequately all around. Thank you. Thank you. Since there are speaker spaces available, we will now call from the wait list for the individual citizens and students category. The first wait list speaker is Git Nan Ning. Please correct me if I, I'm sure I messed it up. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to this office. I'm the person is so hardworking every day. And uh, we bought the house at the Nottingham area. And nobody know me, no letter, no nothing. Then they changed the school song. The children, this September elementary will be go to the other school. The middle school will be go to Parkville. Nottingham area suppose is a Pearly Hall. And we bought that house a 15 year ago. We live in, in the city. It's so hard working, try to change the children go to the school from Pelly Hall. We buy that house before we look it up, what location, middle school, elementary school, high school, and easy to the bus. We are working parents. We have no time to send the student to the school. And now, nobody let us know then change the school song. And if you're familiar with Hall, the barrier low, the right, the other side is the park field more close. Only one mile, they go to the Parkville Middle School. We go to Nottingham, go to the Parkville Middle School so before quarter mile. Morning, if a hot traffic, you will use it 25 to 30 minutes, then go there. If it's snow, no bus, bus is slowly, 
We are parents working, and we send the children go to the school, should be maybe one hour. And you go, you come. That's uh, we supposing not as bad that kind of time and the location. Please, if you can do, and uh, let our choice. That's the number one. Number two, if you build a house later, not the 15 year, 20 year, 30 year before, you build a house right now, then you can stand in the Pele Hall Elementary, a Pele Hall High School, and Pele Hall Middle. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Peter Ng. Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having us, and thank you for uh, inviting the public to speak here. Um, going along with what my mother said, I'm here representing a lot of households, a lot of minority households that couldn't be here. Uh, there are two recent changes to the boundary surveys that changed schools in the Nottingham Perry Hall area, and none of us knew until we found out that it was already changed. Um, we were told that it changed and there's nothing you can do. Um, we weren't made aware of these boundary studies. There were no postal uh, notifications. I mean, we get the property tax bill every year. It would have been simple to receive something in paper. Um, these homes and communities, they are near Slater in Nottingham. They were built about 15 to 30 years ago and they've been part of Perry Hall since then. Um, I've had direct family members in the Perry Hall school system where there, there was a tragic event in 2012. I remember parents waiting all around the bus stops making sure kids felt safe, business owners offering volunteer opportunities and work opportunities during the summer, and now all of a sudden we're not part of Perry Hall anymore. I don't know how that's possible, and I don't think it was done in a way that was inclusive because none of our neighbors knew about this happening besides after it happened. Even one neighbor was a teacher and they ended up moving because of the school change. So I wish there is some way that you can offer more transparency, equality and collaboration to help ordinary citizens who are not involved and come here to every meeting to be able to participate. A simple letter would suffice in the mail to say, you know, your home is being affected by this change. Please come to this meeting and voice your opinion not after the fact that it happened. Because these homes were built 15 to 30 years ago, these people formed the tax base for Perry Hall, invested in their homes, and to uplift an entire house, you know, sell your house, buy somewhere else, isn't something reasonable to expect of taxpaying citizens. I don't know if you can reverse it, but if, you would, if there are any way to appeal, I would like to know that so that I can let our neighbors know and we can all, you know, sign a petition or something like that in case there's something we can do. We fear that because they changed the elementary, they changed the middle, and now the high school will be changed. And when it says Perry Hall on the deeds for our homes, that doesn't mean anything anymore because it's arbitrary any time it can just be changed. Going forward, I think this process has to involve members from the public who are affected, not just a third party company and not just people who are involved every day. Homeowners need a chance to voice their input. So thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ms. Alexa Skyuto. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. It was just two. That's two. Okay. No, I'm sorry. You're not able to speak today. But you could sign up for next time. Yes. Okay, so next is public comment on board policy 1300, use of school facilities. And the first speaker is Dr. Ferrone. I 
I'd like to talk to you today from my heart, not really from my note. My uncle and cousins are white, blonde, blue eyes. They look like the Norwegians. You wonder where did that come from? Crusaders. What happened to the Crusaders? They got married to Arab girls and blended in. So this policy mentions in page one, line 16, uh, the word church. And I already reported it. And it might be a mishap, um, etc. But I, I want to talk about separation of religion from the government, church versus state. It's still there in the school system, in curriculum, in this policy, all right? Um, and what's the implication of that? I pointed to you in the past that we as a nation spend $4 trillion with the T on the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan. Two religious wars, also motivated by money, which President Eisenhower often time warned us then to worry about the military industrial complex. But those two wars were religious wars, wars of want and not wars of defense of the United States. And now there is something more going on along the same line. I just to want to mention to you that, you know, with me being a Baltimorean or Bolimorian for 50 years, I've seen it there. You really don't want a curriculum or policies or anything else to tinker with the First Amendment, to address propaganda for one religion over others. You need to be open about that subject. Horace Mann already mentioned that 300 years ago. Second part of the policy that I need to mention to you that facilities have to be open to the public. So if I do a birthday reservation for my son, I guess I have to open it to anybody who comes in and eat my son's cake. And I'm being, trying to be a little bit funny after talking to you about something more serious. I ask you basically to address those issues. I did in my email provide. Thank, yep. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Dr. Farrell. The next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report, and for that, I call on Dr. Rogers. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, and members of the board. Pleased to present the April superintendent's report. First topic I'd like to review is to share uh, feedback and the results of the inclement weather survey that we provided to all stakeholders in BCPS. Um, as I shared in a previous meeting, the Senate Bill 610, uh, Chapter 804, change school systems in Maryland, how we can move forward with virtual inclement weather days. As a result, we extended a survey to our school um, population, and you see more than 13,000 respondents um, responded to the survey. We asked the two main questions were whether or not um, stakeholders wanted us to extend the school year in the case of inclement weather days. Um, you see there is a strong disagreement for extending the school year beyond the last day of school. And we also asked whether or not stakeholders would like us to transition to virtual instruction days after the built-in days um, of the calendar were used. Uh, there is strong agreement for transitioning to virtual after using the first three days.
as I indicated, our staff, students, and parents do not want us to extend the school year beyond the last posted day of school, and they are in favor of transitioning to virtual learning after the traditional inclement weather days have been used. This is um, the same feedback that we've received from members of Team BCPS for the last three years. And even though uh, school systems had flexibility over the last three years, our plan has always been to implement traditional inclement weather days first before um, transitioning to virtual days. The new legislation now requires for school systems to use all of the traditional days that are built into the calendar first. Um, the new legislation allows for the use of virtual days in cases of severe weather that uh, are likely to impact attendance. And so the potential impact for us for the upcoming school year would be the same as the plan for this year and the previous year. Days one, two, three, those are traditional uh, weather days. And day four and beyond, if we had additional inclement weather, we would transition to virtual. <coughs> Our current plan on the BCPS website um, speaks to the schedule that we would use. We would implement a two-hour delay schedule to ensure that teachers have an opportunity to shift over plans and parents were aware of what schedule students would be working on synchronously. We would communicate in advance as much as possible. Um, we will continue to be one-to-one -one access in terms of student devices, um, as well as other opportunities for students to make up any work that is missed on an inclement weather day. And so as part of the report, I wanted to share with you the results. We do have a later agenda item um, for discussion on this topic if there are any questions. The next item that I wanted to provide an update is on highly effective staff. As Team BCPS is aware, one of our priorities is making sure that we have highly effective teachers, leaders, and staff in Baltimore County Public Schools. Uh, we are proud that on March 12th, we, heard, uh, we held our first uh, job fair for all positions, all schools, as well as central offices. We had more than 800 attendees um, that evening. Uh, this is uh, several hundred more than uh, attended our job fair last year. Um, we also have are proud to announce advances that we are making in the areas of recruitment and retention, specifically um, as a result of our partnership with the county executive that we are able to move our starting salary for teachers to $60,000. That brings us uh, to uh, among the highest in the state of Maryland, and this is two years prior to the requirement of the blueprint. Additionally, we will continue to offer relocation bonuses for teachers that are willing to come um, to Baltimore County Public Schools from out of state up to 2,500 to help them um, to move to uh, Baltimore County. Uh, we have the highest amount of planning um, for teachers in the state of Maryland. Um, we have expanded our face-to-face -face and virtual recruitment and advertisement offices, uh, excuse me, um, options, and we are reinvigorating our uh, partnerships with universities, have met with all of the local university presidents and uh, enhancing our current pathways, developing new, new cohorts based on our areas of need um, to help us with recruitment efforts. In the area of retention, because it's very important to bring new teachers to Baltimore County and staff members, but it's just as important or more important to keep the teachers that we have. Some of our work around this effort includes our three-year contract to make sure that all of our staff has stability in terms of their expectations for their livelihood so we can all focus on the needs of our students. Uh, we are moving to mandatory new educators orientation as opposed to optional to ensure that anyone who is 
new to our district or new to teaching ha is equipped with the tools necessary to meet the needs of our students. And we are revamping our entire professional learning. Uh, we are excited to kick off professional learning uh, for so many members of Team BCPS, including our teachers, our paraprofessionals, central office staff, leaders, leaders differentiated by elementary and secondary level uh, to make sure that we are really coming together and ensuring coherence across Team BCPS to reduce the variability uh, that we have in our schools and offices. We are bringing back teacher mentors, moving away from uh, electronic um, uh, methods of providing new teachers with support and providing a person that teachers can count on, not only for help with content or with pedagogy, how to teach, but also a person to just um, you know reassure them and provide that support that's needed on a regular basis. Um, we have revised our climate survey and reduced the number of uh, items, but really honed in on those items that speak to school and office culture. As a result, this year we had uh, not only more than uh, 20,000, I believe, respondents from last year, uh, but the highest number of respondents that we've ever had on a climate survey in Baltimore County Public Schools. And we are really working across all of our unions uh, collaboratively to focus on work conditions, to um, problem solve in the moment, to meet the needs of our uh, teachers and staff members. Uh, we have more upcoming job fairs, uh, primarily one in the East Zone, one in the West Zone for any schools that have uh, remaining openings on the screen. You see the dates and the locations uh, for those job fairs. And I would be remiss if I didn't provide a shout out to our um, team for recruitment, um, the recruitment staffing side on both um, sides. I think I've shared at some of the community events um, last year at our peak, uh, with with teacher transfers, we had approximately 487 teachers on the list. This year, we had more than 500 teachers um, that when we started this season on the list. As of earlier today, we were in the 90s. Um, and I want to remind everyone, it is April 16th. Those meetings used to happen um, at the earliest in May in Baltimore County Public Schools. So this is our commitment to our teachers and our staff that the work that they do is critically important. We want to retain them. We don't want them spending weeks and months wondering about where they are going to end up. And so our teams are doing this work in real time to take care of our, all of our teachers and staff. Additionally, I wanted to provide an update on the FY25 uh, budget. Uh, we did share a news release. County Executive Oshevsky presented his operating budget proposal to fully fund our budget. And as a result of our partnership for additional items um, that I advocated for, uh, those funds were added into his budget. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the salary, the, uh, the starting salary of our teachers um, is going up to $60,000. We are adding additional teachers and bus drivers, um, additional teachers uh, really anticipating um, in increases in enrollment, particularly around the lowest, lower grades and uh, enrollment for our English language learners um, to our schools. We're very proud um, that we are um, going to be sharing the details with our community soon. About $250,000 that is now available for us to expand dual college access to our students who are non-CCR um, for this upcoming year because the changes that were approved by the Maryland State Department of Education uh, don't go into effect until the next year. Uh, there is a final step of the budget process, and so we are very hopeful uh, with our pa partners on the County Council uh, that on May 23rd, we will receive approval for our FY25 budget impacting Team BCPS. I want to talk a little bit about college and career readiness. Um, as you see in the center, these are this is our pathway to student success. Um, but what you see flanking on both sides speaks to our commitment for FY25, really starting with our youngest learners and based on your approval of the budget being able to expand in the areas of greatest need, again, calling everyone's attention to our expanded pre-K programs. Um, 
across all three zones, concentrated in the West Zone and East Zone. And if you'll uh, recall, looking at our maps in terms of student performance, those are the areas where our students have the greatest need. And then if you go to the opposite side, uh, our updates to college and career readiness. As I mentioned, the State Board has some revised standards um, that are going to make thousands more of our students, approximately 2,500 uh, plus students that will now be college and career ready because instead of only being able to use the MCAP assessment, our students are able to use having a GPA of at least 3.0 in addition to Algebra 1 grade of A, B, or C. And so we are um, excited for the um, students next year that can avail themselves to that. Uh, but unfortunately, um, it does not currently apply to our seniors. We have advocated to the state uh, to find out if there is any room for that. But in the meantime, we've worked with our partners, not only the county executive, but also um, Dr. Curt Nitus, president of CCBC, and they are uh, granting us a $1 million one-time grant um, for students who are non-CCR to provide some extended, expanded access. And so families should expect to hear um, in the upcoming uh, days and weeks um, how families and how students who are non-CCR but willing to do the work um, to be reassessed can uh, benefit from these additional funds. Lastly, we want to talk about safety and climate. Uh, this is a topic that uh, we've been speaking about throughout uh, the district in all of our community conversations. Uh, most recently in today's press conference, um, I shared some information regarding our expectations for members of uh, Team BCPS for our community, but want to talk about uh, our responsibilities as a school system, where we need partnership um, from families, what we should be doing together, and just some highlights across this year. Um, as a school system, we take full responsibility for making sure that we have clear expectations and consequences um, for student behaviors in our schools, making sure that schools come together with teams to create positive behavior plans, that we are expanding mental health supports to our students. We're very excited about the pilot that we have in middle school, the full access that we have for all of our high school students, and in the coming weeks, working with the state, um, sharing, being able to share um, additional grant funding that we have received for additional uh, supports. Our community schools, in addition to mental health supports, can provide uh, medical supports and other um, financial resources for families. Our continued partnership with our SROs and student safety assistance in our middle schools, high schools, and we have an elementary um, differentiated model. We're responsible for consistent enforcement across schools to reduce the variability and responding um, when students make decisions that are against our code of conduct and communicating that to uh, the respective communities. From parents, caregivers, and guardians, uh, we need um, that positive examples are set at home um, and in the community. We want uh, parents and caregivers to um, help to limit and monitor monitor um, social media, cell phone use, uh, monitor the friend groups, possessions of students, as well as uh, what students are saying that they need, and reporting any safety concerns directly to schools um, and law enforcement so we can respond to that quickly. Um, together, we should make sure that we have strong homeschool partnerships, that we are all modeling the values that are important to Team BCPS, that we have a shared commitment for safety um, and civil discourse to talk about um, uh, topics that where we might have some disagreement, and that we are all committed to connecting students to resources. In the column regarding st um, school year 23-24, we'll note that the chief complaints that were provided at the community conversations that we had in the summer was a lack of consistency in terms of implementing um, policies that we had on the book re with regards to discipline, as well as timely communication uh, to our communities. Um, throughout the year, we have heard um, feedback indicating improvements in these areas. Um, feedback, 
not only from um, uh, uh, parents, but also from our uh, lawmaker partners. Um, one of the groups that I meet with is a student advisory, and I go from high school to high school and meet with groups of students to ask them about their specific experiences, areas um, where we are doing well, as well as areas of improvement, and they have provided firsthand um, experience uh, first-hand uh, experiences as well as feedback. Uh, we also have uh, school-based school, school -based, uh, staff members, principals, and central office advisories and, uh, con and a disciplined stakeholder group uh, to help us to continue to improve in this area. Uh, the last uh, tab speaks to the number of safety assistants that we have in our schools. It also highlights that all of our safety assistants um, are required to participate in 70 hours of training led by the Maryland Center for School Safety. This is in addition to the BCPS training that we provide our school uh, safety assistance and the feedback provided by principals in terms of the impact that our safety assistants are having in our schools. And so wanted to provide an update on where we were with safety and climate. Um, this year we will do as we did last year, which is to meet with principals by level to review all of the discipline data for the school system, give them an opportunity to review the code of conduct and provide direct feedback on any changes that are necessary for the upcoming year. So with that, I want to thank you for the opportunity to share an update. Thank you. And as mentioned, we will, um, there will be questions for the Clement Weather Day items um, in item Q. The next item on the agenda is the chair's report. And while we're getting that presentation up, so how's everybody doing? I see we, we got to get some energy in this room. <laughs> we started off strong, energy is waning. So, we'll, um, so hopefully we can bring it back up. So um, good evening, everyone. As always, I am happy to provide the chair's report to share with the public how the board is collectively working together to improve our school system. And I wanted to start with this quote. Every system is perfectly designed to get the results that it gets. For the last 12 years, Baltimore County Public Schools has experienced unprecedented decline in student achievement. As a board, we are committed to improving the outcomes for our students. And it starts with the systems and structures that we are implementing to govern the school system. The purpose of this chair's report is to provide an update to the public on the work that the Board of Education is doing to ensure that we are implementing best practices for school system governance that will increase the likelihood of improved student achievement. In this presentation, I will share what we have learned through our onboarding process, training with the Maryland Association of Boards of Education, and through professional learning experiences with the National Association of Boards of Education regarding the roles and responsibilities of board members. I am also going to share how the board is collectively working together to ensure that our governance systems and structures are designed to improve student outcomes. We all care how we do our job as board members, and we are all working hard to be the best board members possible. The content in this report is not new to any of the board members. We have all participated in onboarding training and professional learning experiences that address the content in this presentation. I am hopeful that this presentation will provide clarity to the public on how we operate and how and why certain decisions are made. At the core, the board and the superintendent must function as a team with specific duties for, for the board and for the superintendent. As a board, we ground our work in the big picture items. We focus on the what for the school system. These are things such as the vision, goals, policies. We monitor how things are implemented. And we have one collective voice as a board that comes through how we vote and how we render decisions on topics. The superintendent focuses on the details, 
things such as specific action plans, rules, objectives, and other items that address how to accomplish big picture items as agreed upon by the board. And there's this delicate balance between governance and management structure. And we work hard not to blur the lines. Because blurring the lines, it could compromise the ability of the board to effectively govern the school system. It could impact our ability to vote on matters, and it could impact our quasi-judicial quasi function um, as we de render decisions on appeals. And I'll just give an example of how these lines could be blurred. For example, we all want safe schools. And collectively, as a board, we have approved a budget that was formulated by the superintendent and her team that prioritized the allocation of resources to enhance safety. So let's say an individual board member works for an organization that has a wonderful safety program. It would be inappropriate for that individual board member to direct the superintendent to work with that organization. This could compromise the board's member's ability to vote on a contract that could come from the organization, and it could compromise the program from ever coming to the Baltimore County Public Schools. As a board, we follow an agreed upon process to review and approve plans and contracts so that we do not unintentionally prevent programs that could support our students from coming to our school system. And I'll give another example. Let's say an individual board member wants to implement a program and a board member goes to union representatives and teachers and principals to garner support for that program. This again could blur the line between governance and school manage and the management of the school system. And it can put our union representatives, our teachers, and our principals in very uncomfortable situations um, because it, it's now a power dynamic and they may feel as though they need to, um, to appease what the board member is, is wanting. And so it's a delicate balance, and so we want to ensure that we are establishing and we, have our, and we are following the established protocols. And if the established protocols are not working, then collectively as a board, we can revise them. This also goes when the public requests specific things from certain board members. We have to collectively operate as one board. So we could bring the recommendation to the entire board for a decision, but it is beyond the scope for an individual board member to direct a superintendent or any of the staff members to do anything because we are, we function as a collective board. It is one voice and that voice is rendered through our vote. And so, you know, I'm, I'm really emphasizing that we function as this collective entity. And sometimes we're asked, you know, during public comment period, why do we not provide, why do, not, why do we not engage in dialogue with our public comment, the people who come for public comment? And our board meetings, they're business meetings conducted in the public. We value what the public has to say, we value public comments, and we use them to inform our governance decision. As a board, because we operate as a collective entity, we respond to information or questions via policy and after we have done our due diligence. There are some decisions or actions that require a vote of our board. So know that we wanna hear from you and, so, and know that we are making improvements to our practices. So you'll notice now in during, um, when we have public hearings, for instance, we have incorporated a practice where board members can ask clarifying questions. During our public comment session, during our board meeting, it's because we need to really do our due diligence before a response and we need to ground our responses in policy, we typically will not engage in a back and forth dialogue. We have new state law, for, we have new state laws for education, the blueprint for Maryland's future. We have revised priorities for our school system and we have an intense focus on improving student achievement. We have been doing some things for a long time that have historically not served our students well as demonstrated by 12 years of academic decline. Some of the things we are doing may not be in tight alignment with the new state laws and the priorities for our school system. 
We owe it to the Baltimore County community to examine our practices and hold ourselves accountable for implementing the best available research informed practices for board governance. We are in the process as a board of revising our board handbook, which includes our vision, mission, and goals. We're revising our board goals. We are revising our board self-evaluation so that how are we holding ourselves accountable? And we are also taking a deep look at our board committees. Board committees, if you have been watching board committee meetings, we have, they have been actively discussing their purpose. Every committee was charged to identify their purpose and measures of effectiveness. We have inherited a committee structure that may have some shortcomings. And so the questions that we are asking each committee to consider revolves around what are the purpose and goals of each committee? How is the work of the committee advancing the school system and supporting improved student outcomes? And we are looking at, is there a different format needed to better address the intent of committees? So once again, if our focus is on students, and for the last 12 years there has been significant academic decline, we cannot keep doing the same things the same way and expecting a different result. We know right now that Baltimore County Board of Education has more committees than other school districts that are similar in size yet higher performing. We also know that key structures, key research-based structures that, that should govern any team, any committee, may not always be evident in our committee meetings. Things such as measures of effectiveness, clear decision-making process, and research to support recommendations that, that then come back to the board for a decision. Also, our committee structure may unintentionally limit public transparency. If a citizen tries to follow, a, let's just say, a curriculum contract from its start to its end, you may have to watch multiple curriculum committee meetings. You may have to watch multiple building and contracts committee meetings. And then you would have to watch the general board of education meeting just to understand the scope and the breadth of discussion that occurred around this one contract. Is that the best way to engage with the public? We owe it to the public to ensure that our committees are adhering to research informed practices and that it supports a governance structure that will improve student outcomes. And I wanna just close on this quote, that if we continue to do what has always been done, we will continue to get the results that we have always gotten. And I can tell you that the results that we have gotten the last 12 years is not acceptable. It's not acceptable to our parents. It's not acceptable to our staff, our teachers, our principals. It's not acceptable to our community members. And it's not acceptable for the economic development of Baltimore County. We are graduating the next generation of workers. And if we are graduating people who are not able to read and write proficiently, then there is a problem. So how can we, as a board, establish systems and structures that ensures that our students are ready when they graduate? How can we establish systems and structures that are aligned to the priorities that we have all agree on, agreed on with our school system? And how can we establish systems and structures where we are using the staff members' times productively and we are getting resources and, and research that is really moving the school system along? And so with that, I will end the chair's report and know that there is more to come from the work of the Baltimore County Board of Education. The next agenda item is the student board members report. And for that, I call on Ms. Drummond. Good evening, everyone. As the school year begins to come to an end, so does my term, meaning we have been in the search for the 2024-2025 student member of the board. We took applications, held, <clears throat> held interviews, and had two candidates campaign to win students' votes. On April 4th, 
Ugonma Chikekalu, a junior at Western Tech, won the election and will be the next student member of the board. I can guarantee that she will put her all into the position and do everything with passion and in the favor of Baltimore County students. As for me, in the next couple of days, I will be visiting students from Towson High School and Dumbarton Middle School. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the consideration of the proposed public charter schools in which the board heard a report for two applications at their March 19, 2024 board meeting. The first application was for the bilingual global citizens public charter school. Board members at the recommendation of the superintendent, may I have a motion to approve the application for the bilingual global citizens public charter school? So moves to Lusky. Is there a second? Second from Pong. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Frampong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. The second application was for the Puzzle Pieces Learning Academy Public Charter School. Board members, at the recommendation of the superintendent, may I have a motion to deny the application of the, for the Puzzle Pieces Learning Academy Public Charter School? So move, Lichter. Is there a second? Second from Paul. Any discussion? May I have a roll call? Oh, yes, Ms. from Pong. So um, at, the, at the last board meeting, we saw this presentation about the recommendation and it was to deny. Um, but we also subsequently heard from, I believe, members associated with the school itself. So was there any additional information um, that we should be considering at this point? Or was anything else submitted? And so we're following the process where they submitted their application um, it's been reviewed, and so they the, they would have the opportunity to um, to submit another application during the next cycle. But based off of the, um, we're making our decision based off of what was submitted for the application within the time frame that they had. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? No. Ms. Frempo? No. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Motion carries. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session, and for that I call on Ms. Devasti Jones. Good evening. Um, this evening earlier, the board met in closed session in its um, quasi-judicial capacity regarding three um, hearing matters um, where they rendered a decision. At this time, it would be appropriate um, time to confirm those actions um, regarding case number HE24-12, HE24-15, and HE24-18. May I have a motion to affirm the action taken during closed session on hearing examiner's case HE24-12 in which no argument was requested and authorize Ms. Gover to sign for those board members not physically present? So moved from Paul. Is there a second? Second, Harvey. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. May I have a motion to affirm the action taken during closed session on hearing examiner's case HE24-15 in which no argument was requested and authorize Ms. Gover to sign for those board members not physically present? So moved, Lichter. Is there a second? Second, Stolesky. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Frempong? No. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. 
May I have a motion to affirm the action taken during closed session on hearing examiner's case HE 24-18 in which no argument was requested and authorize Ms. Gover to sign for those board members not physically present. So moved, Stileski. Is there a second? Second, Lichter. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Stileski? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Frumpong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. The next item on the agenda is new, is new business report on board policies. This is the first reader for this policy, and for that I call on Ms. Christina Pumphrey, Chair of the Policy Review Committee. Members of the board, the Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's recommendation of proposed changes to board policy 1300, use of school facilities. This policy is presented to you on tonight's agenda as exhibit L1. May I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the board's Policy Review Committee for board policy 1300? So moved, from Paul. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? Uh, Ms. Pumphrey. I'm just gonna to speak to the, um, some information from PRC. After receiving feedback from community members as well as a few board members, Policy 1300 was added to PRC's agenda as an exp in an expedited fashion for review. Requests for gathering, gathering permits from Baltimore County were being denied for events that have traditionally been held on BCPS property because the current application for use of facilities form does not have an option to reserve parking lots. By removing the language as recommended by PRC, parking lots will be added to the application for use of facilities forms. Um, staff members, including Dr. Graham and Mr. Dixit, answered several questions during our discussion regarding the slight change to policy 1300, which led to PRC's recommendation to remove the sentence, the, av the availability of parking lots is on a first come, first serve basis. Thank you. Mr. McMillian. I just want to clarify. So if somebody puts in a permit, if we vote, vote in favor of this and it removes that parking lot clause out of the policy, then when, a, when an individual or a group applies for a permit to use one of our facilities, it's, the understanding is that the parking lot comes along with the application and is approved with the approval of the building or for fields or whatever we're using. We should allow um, staff members to respond to that question. Yes. Dr. Grimm. Good evening. Um, to restate your question, if a use of facilities request is submitted through the system and it includes the parking lot as part of the use of facilities request, would staff have the opportunity to comment, approve that? Is that your question, Mr. McMillian? Is it understood that the parking lot goes along with approval? Or is it something that has to be, is there a check box? That's correct. There's a, there, so uh, previously parking lot was available as a space to request on the use of facilities with the change in policy that occurred uh, previously or recently. Um, we removed that because we would be in violation of board policy um, since it had become first come, first serve. So there was no opportunity for the public to make that selection. If the board removes this line, it's our understanding that we can then add that checkbox back on the use of facilities request form. Okay. So if a group wants to use a field and, and they put in their permit to use that field and there's going to be a checkbox where they say, we want to use the parking lot along with the field, then that will be go through the process and be approved or disapproved. That is correct. Okay. And how about for anybody that's already submitted that and that, that for example, a carnival, if a carnival's already submitted their, uh, their uh, permit and it was, they and anticipated the use of the parking lot, how do they, so chances are that was disapproved because the parking lot was included? Or, or the parking lot was because it was a first come first serve, the parking lot wasn't even approached? So we, that's some, some of the conundrum that, so, that the public has had is that uh, because they were unable to request that as a space in, within a BCPS facility, they were unable to obtain approval from BCPS, 
without the approval from BCPS to use the facility, in many cases, it's our understanding that the county would not issue permits for certain events. Okay, so those groups need to, to go through the process in a relatively quick fashion to get approval if they have a summer activity or something coming up. So we're, we're prepared as staff uh, when the board, if the board approves this change to the policy, we're prepared to add that selection back in the use of facilities within 24 hours of the board's approval. Okay. Thank you very much for all your answers. Thanks. Any other? Ms. Vermpal? Um, Dr. Graham, can you just speak to, this was also brought up in, um, the PRC committee meeting and just talk about the idea of enforcement though, as far as if the parking lots are, um, I guess, granted access, that BCPS though, as far as enforcement and, and how that all works. Absolutely, so um, the in enforcement of a parking lot, we do not have uh, staff that are patrolling our, our parking lots on any frequency. While we do have school security staff that patrol our, our schools in regularity, um, they're not there to enforce permits. Um, so just like any other permit holder, if there was some type of an issue, they would be contacting law enforcement to assist with that. Um, the holder of a permit as issued by uh, Baltimore County for a specific event would have would have that as their support um, to obtain that permit in many cases they would again have needed our approval um, as BCPS for their event on our on our property so does that answer your question I just wanted it to be also brought up in this meeting in case Certainly. there were any questions so thank you. yes ma'am okay may I have a roll call vote Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Stileski? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Motion carries. Madam Chair. Ms. Pumphrey, yes. Members of the board, according to policy 8134D, the board may waive the two reading process. I move that the board waive the second reader and vote immediately to approve to policy 1300. Do I have a second? Second, Young. It is moved and seconded that we waive the second reader for policy 1300. If this motion passes, the policy amendments as recommended by PRC will be adopted. Ms. Gover, please call the roll. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Stileski? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank Motion you. carries. The next item on the agenda is new business, special project request for Maiden Choice School. And for that, I call on Dr. Jones and Dr. Mullinex. Good evening. Good evening, Board Chair Booker Dwyer, um, Vice Chair Pumphrey, and Dr. Rogers. I am here representing um, Dr. Mullinex and Meet and Choice, and my colleague, um, Dr. Jess Grimm, who's been a tremendous support in this work. I am here to request that the Board review and approve 7330 project request for Meet and Choice installation of kitchen laundry room equipment. As a reminder, we came to the board earlier this year to discuss the equitable access for our students attending Meet and Choice. May I have a motion to approve the, seven, the 7330 special project request for the installation of a kitchen and laundry room for Meet and Choice School? So moved, Harvey. Is there a second? Second, second. Pumphrey. Any discussion? Ms. Harvey. I just want to uh, speak to the work that Principal uh, West and her team have been doing at Made in Choice. If you've ever been there, you see the enthusiasm and the commitment of the staff. Uh, you see that they are committed to innovative and engaging ways to grow each and every student and meet them where they are so that they can meet their full potential. Uh, I fully support uh, this project and would ask that my colleagues do the same. Thank you. 
Okay. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Jalewski? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominelski? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Motion carries. May I have a motion to approve the 7330 special project request for the planting of a perennial uh, gardens, I'm just out of it today, for Maiden Choice School. Um, so moved, Stileski. Is there a second? Second, Lichter. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Stileski? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Frampong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Motion carries. Thank, Thank you. you, Dr. Thank Jones. You. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is contract awards, and for that I call on Ms. Harvey, Chair of the Buildings and Contracts Committee. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Members of the board, the board the board's Building and Contract Committee met on Monday, April 15, 2024. Items N2 through N19, or items N1 through N19 were forwarded to the full board for approval. It has been requested that item N1 be separated uh, for consideration. Okay. So do I have a motion to approve items N2 through N19? No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. So moved from Paul. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Stileski? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Ms. Harvey, would you like to speak to N1? I will uh, defer, defer to board member Frimpong, who requested that the item be separated. Ms. Frimpong. Thank you. So I just had a few questions on this particular contract um, relating to the special education consultants. Um, so there was a previous contract that was five years. The term of this contract is five years as well. Is that something that's dictated by us as a school system? Is it by the vendor or are there a certain state or federal regulation? Can Allison Myers, special ed executive director, come forward as well? Thank you. There you go. I was, I was hoping you'd be here. <laughs> This is, I think, more of your question. That Maybe you can, could you repeat the question? Just so sure. We, <laughs> I just, sure. Thank you. I, um, I saw that this was a five-year contract. The previous contract was also five years. I was asking whether or not it is the five years, is that just something dictated by us, by the vendor, or is there any state or federal regulations relating to the five years? Actually, I believe that's dictated by us. I'll let uh, Mr. <coughs> Rob Berta, Ber Bertison our uh, manager in purchasing uh, address the question. Certainly. Um, there is no statute that requires it. This is, however, um, generally how our office, how the Office of Purchasing looks at establishing these contracts. Um, the five-year period gives an ability to work with a set group of vendors of, of consultants that we can continue to develop a relationship so they understand the people that they're working with. It promotes, you know, a good interaction between those staff members and developing the staff uh, relationship with BCPS. Okay, thank you. So that leads into my next question, which was as far as the effectiveness of this. Um, so it's used for on-site teaching and staff coaching. Um, but do we have any direct data that shows how the use of these consultants helps with compliance for special education or reduces the number of private placements um, or even these individual student settlement agreements? Yes, absolutely. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you all. Um, so the primarily, this contract does support what is called a um, non-public preventative partnership, um, which is housed at White Oak School and is our verbal behavior program. That actually was developed approximately 10 years ago, and um, the entire purpose is doing just that, is preventing um, students um, let me say that in a better way. So allowing us to provide the services that would be equal to those that would be in a non-public school 
um, so that the system is able to provide those, which is a cost savings for the system. So while um, there is a cost associated with the contractual behavior analysts, uh, it actually is cost savings, um, even with the amount that we pay for the behavior analysts and comparative to what we'd be paying for each of the tuitions associated with the students that are there. Um, the other aspect of, um, I would invite anyone to uh, visit that. I would love to take anyone who would want to visit that program um, that would be interested. Um, the work that is done is equal to um, that of some of our, like I said, some of our non-public schools, but it's fantastic with regards to really focusing on um, reducing behavior, increasing communication, and allowing students, um, many of the students, to actually be able to remain in our public schools with the growth of skills. Wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. McMillian? I, I want to be official and say I like to visit that school. Great. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Me too. And I'm serious, but let's, I want to get together and we'll make an appointment and I'll do that. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Date. Yeah, I'd love to do that. That's it. Now, I should have started this off. Do I have a motion to approve item N1? So moved, Lictor. <laughs> um, no so second. no second is needed. Um, any discussion, and we just had discussion. Is there any more discussion on item N1? Yes, Ms. Just, Lichter. Just quickly, I have had the privilege of seeing this program um, many times, and it provides a level of service that you would just be astounded by. Um, kids are getting one-on-one -on -one services, but it's highly specialized training that the providers are given, which is why this contract is so important to continue that coaching, um, but it is an unbelievable program. They would have to pull me away from it when I went, went to visit. So I do encourage you to go, but it's, the, it's definitely worth the funding um, to help these kids get where they need to go. Okay, any other discussion? All right, so may I have a roll call vote to approve item N1? Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Frempaw? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the consideration of the proposed board meeting schedule for 2024 2025. Pursuant to Board Policy 8311, each April, the Board of Education will adopt a schedule of its regular meetings for the succeeding school year. The attached dates and times are for the Board of Education meetings, work sessions, public and public hearings for 2024-2025 school year. All regularly scheduled open meetings will begin at 6.30 p.m. on the Greenwood campus in Building E, Room 114. May I have a motion to approve the proposed board meeting schedule for 2024 as presented in Exhibit O? So moved, Lichter. Do I have a second? Second, Stolesky. Any discussion? I do have one discussion item for this uh, agenda. So the December 17th meeting date, when we look at the attendance of boards, of our, of our board, um, right before we close for, um, for the holiday break, we're often not well attended in person. And so will all board members be here for December 17th or should we consider revising that date? So I could- Go ahead, Ms. Rampong. So my question would be, um, I mean, if we still have the ability to attend virtually, even if we're not going to be um, in person due to travel, should that still be acceptable? Yes. Or should we move that meeting to be a fully virtual meeting? All right, I'm just putting it out there because once we adopt this, everyone book your travel on December 18th. <laughs> okay. Any other discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Frempo? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. 
Thank you, board members. In addition to the adoption of this schedule, the board will hold a special virtual meeting on June 25, 2024 to discuss and vote on personnel matters only. The 2023-2024 schedule will be updated to reflect this. The next item on the agenda is the consideration of the proposed FY 2024 budget appropriation transfer. And for that, I call on Mr. Hartlove. Good evening again. Um, so the, uh, the BAT is a thing, is, a, uh, is what we do annually to uh, uh, correct any overages or, or under areas where we're under in our budget. And uh, so just a quick overview of, of, of the uh, BAT and then, and then uh, open it up for any questions that you have. Um, first of all, we are uh, projecting that overall we will finish the year approximately $13 million under budget. Um, based based on close monitoring of expenditures through the first three quarters of 2024, our current full year expenses project uh, projections show an overall surplus, but with shortfalls in some activities and surpluses in others. Transfers of funds between activities requires approval from the Board of Education and the County Council. Um, each quarter, all budget line transfers that make up this BAT were reviewed by the Budget Committee. Um, and I would point out that the BAT totals uh, $56 million, which is less than 3% of our total appropriation. Um, and with that, I open it up to any specific questions on the BAT that, that uh, you have in front of you. May I have a motion to approve the proposed FY 2024 budget appropriation transfer as presented in Exhibit P1? So moved, Frimpong. Do I have a second? Second, Harvey. Any discussion? Ms. Daleski. Yeah, thank you for that. I just have a quick question. So the $13 million um, that will be hopefully left over or roughly that amount, what happens to that money? That thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, thank you for the question. That rolls into our fund balance. So anything at the at, that we have left at the end goes into fund balance, which then we uh, can reappropriate for other needs in the future. Okay. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Tremon? Yes. Ms. Daleski? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Frem Mr. I'm sorry, Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank Motion you. carries. The next item on the agenda is the consideration of the proposed FY 2024 supplemental budget appropriation. And again, I call on Mr. Hartlove. Okay. Uh, this is something that is not necessarily an annual uh, uh, process, but it's something that we do on from time to time when we need to appropriate our fund balance, as we were just referring to. Referring to. So uh, this uh, supplement modifies a board-approved operating budget supplement that was brought to you back and approved back in on November 20th, 2023. The modification is moving from the full uh, contract term of five years to the initial uh, first year term uh, of one year, thereby reducing the FY 2024 supplemental request. So uh, this is uh, providing, uh, will provide or is providing funding which aligns with the support of the July 11th, 2023 board approved contract for an enterprise resource planning ERP system. The system includes general ledger, budgeting, payroll, purchasing, inventory, and human resources uh, uh, processes. So, in in effect, what what's happened here is, is we brought a we brought a budget um, supplemental a supplemental mid year uh, budget for use use of fund balance back in November. Um, the county requested that we just do one year at a time. So you've in effect a, approved the entire five years. Now we're asking you to go back and just they they'd like us to do it one year at a time. So this is really kind of reviewing, what, doing something you've already done, but just doing one step of it as opposed to five steps in one. May I have a motion to approve the proposed FY 2024 supplemental budget appropriation as presented in Exhibit P2? So moves, Stileski. Do I have a second? Second from Paul. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Stileski? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? 
Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer. Yes. Motion carries. The next item on the agenda is a report on inclement weather on the inclement weather day plan 2024 2025. And for that, I call on Dr. Rogers. Thank you. Uh, Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, members of the board, as I shared in the superintendent's report, the feedback from our th over 13,000 respondents indicated that uh, Team BCP BCPS, again, would like us to move forward with traditional inclement weather days before moving to virtual um, inclement weather days. The change in legislation requires that school systems uh, implement the calendar built-in days first, which is in alignment with the plan that we've had in place for the last three years. And the change also requires that this decision is affirmed in open session. Um, and so at this time, I'm happy to take any questions uh, on the data that I provided or on our uh, previous plan. Okay. As Dr. Rogers has stated in section 7-103.2 of the education article, it authorizes each county board to authorize a superintendent to provide virtual education days to students instead of closing schools. The law requires that this matter be discussed at open at an open meeting. There are no if, if there's any further questions. Uh, Ms. Harvey After. after after you use the three, three days. built in i'm not sure that that's clear in this language it just says to provide virtual education days instead of closing schools okay which language were you referring to in the in, in the the language that's appeared here oh okay oh. <laughs> <laughs> of the education I article Yes. So may I have a motion to authorize the superintendent to provide virtual education days after closing schools during, well, after using the three days? That's what we're doing. After using the calendar days of closing schools during a severe weather event. That, okay. So move, Stileski. Do I have a second? Second, Lichter. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Stileski? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Oh, sorry. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Rempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dreyer? Yes. Thank Motion you. carries. The next item on the agenda is the report on the blueprint for Maryland's future. And for that, I call on Dr. Rogers. And I am gonna call on Dr. Wistead and Dr. Staley uh, as they come to the front um, to provide an update. I want to remind uh, members of the board that throughout the beginning of the year, we received individual reports on each pillar of the blueprint, blueprint one through four, with where members of Team BCPS provided an overview of what the expectations were in the legislation and our response um, to those uh, expectations. There has been um, a lot of conversation and communication with internal and external stakeholders regarding the impact of the Blueprint for Maryland's future legislation. We understand that the intent of the legislation was to really meet the needs of all of our students across school systems. Um, and this legislation was um, uh, created prior to COVID. And so with the differential impact of um, 
COVID, school systems are working to move forward with implementing uh, the blueprint for Maryland's future um, and really adhering to the spirit of that part of our shift as a school system. Um, we can't thank Dr. Wistead enough, who last year um, was holding up with both hands and some other appendages <laughs> all of the uh, pillars of blueprint. Um, but this year, we have come together across divisions. She has a partner who's at the table with her, Dr. Staley, and we are pleased for them to share um, the work that have, has occurred this year and also to report on uh, the reports that we have already submitted to the state and an upcoming report that's due in May. So Dr. Wistan. Thank you. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Um, as a reminder for everyone, the Blueprint for Maryland's Future has five pillars to it, early childhood education, high quality and diverse teachers and leaders, college and career readiness, more resources to ensure all students are successful, and the governance and accountability pillar. And that aligns very well with our four priority areas, academic achievement, infrastructure, highly effective teachers, leaders, and staff, and the safety and climate. Something we did this year when we started our vision setting and, and planning for writing our second plan was to work with groups and talk about where would students be in 2033 once we fully um, implement things, so would they be better prepared for college, career, and life at that time. So next slide, please. We had um, two plans that have been submitted. Last school year, we submitted one in March where there was a focus on what did we do the year prior, the 21-22 you know, school year, what were we were doing last school year, and what did we plan to do this school year. The plan for this year um, is very different than that. It, it's in two sections, one section which we've already submitted and uh, another section which will be submitted May 1st. And it really focused on our planning and implementation, discussing what did we do already and what was challenging about that and then what do we plan to do to rectify that? What strategies are we gonna put into place and what are our next steps for those things? Next slide. So the portion that we turned in March 15th had different sections where we had to discuss the vision alignment of the blueprint legislation and the Baltimore County Public Schools vision. We had to talk about how we were communicating all of that information to our stakeholders. We also had to discuss systemic changes that were needed in Baltimore County Public Schools for the implementation of the blueprint. We had to highlight our three greatest challenges, which Dr. Staley is gonna go through in detail for you. And then we have to talk about how are we monitoring the progress of the blueprint and how did we overcome those challenges and, and work with that. Part two, so that section's already uh, been submitted and it's posted on our website for your review. The part two that we're about to submit on May 1st really gets into details of each of the five pillars um, with their 23 subtasks that they ask us about. And again, there's this theme of what did you do? Look at your plan from last year. What did you do? What challenges did you come across for them? And what adaptations and new strategies did you put into place or do you plan to put into place to overcome those challenges? So now Dr. Staley is gonna talk about our challenges. Well, good evening. And when we identify, remember the plan asked us to identify three challenges um, and only three. And so what we looked to do was build those challenges and you'll see the three that are here. They all relate to pillar one, which is around expanding early childhood access. And what we are looking at is what's happening for full day and that's our four-year-olds and also our three-year-olds. So the challenge we identified is really this part, the component that deals with expanding for our three-year-olds. Um, the second challenge that we identified deals with implementing high-quality instructional materials. Um, this challenge itself is around pillar three. And so we'll go into more details as we go through each pillar in a second, but that's pillar three. Um, pillar two, relates to recruiting and hiring teachers in critical need areas that are representative of the students that we, we serve in Baltimore County. That's pillar two. As Melissa mentioned, there's also a pillar four, 
And that pillar four addresses more resources for our students who are multilingual, receiving special education service, experiencing poverty. You will see it in our report. What we've embedded is those components in pillar one, two, and three. So we didn't have to tease that out as a separate challenge. We were only allowed to do three. So that's why pillar four is not addressed directly, but it's indirectly addressed and connected throughout. The pillars don't sit independently. They are interwoven together. So if you go to the next slide. When we, when we look at our first challenge, which was around pillar one, and, and these weren't in any kind of sequential order. This is just the first one in our document. Um, here's the strategies we identified. The first one around partnering with private providers. So we're looking at who out there in the private sector can provide seats for us that can, can get certified to, to be pre-K, which is great, age four and also age three to help service with students. So do we in Baltimore County have some, and they have them also. So there's a lot of work going to be done around that. The second one is around developing a more comprehensive public and private facility utilization. That's about space. So of course, when we build new buildings, elementary buildings, we can put seats in there. But for the buildings that we currently have, identifying space, but how do we identify space in private sector also that we can utilize too. Um, and then the third one is about supporting kindergarten readiness prior to elementary to um, students' enrollment in BCPS. So what happens to students, our children who are coming to us, and how can we expand access and support for them in a pre-K and a preschool setting, um, be it private or public? If you go to the next slide, when we speak about pillar three, um, this relates to implementing high quality instructional materials to support our students so they can be on track um, to be pre-identified for college and career readiness based on the measures determined by MSCE. And what you see here is probably three strategies, and you've heard integrity of implementation of high quality materials and just the importance of that. And a lot of that work has already started, and we do, we, we do that and we get feedback on that through our learning walks. So our learning walks that we already conduct are a part of that. But there's a whole lot more work that's going to be done with supporting through that strategy. The second strategy is to develop professional learning communities. And so I, I put a big smile on my face because when you see um, how our systemic work lines up with what we need to do for Blueprint, um, you probably already know that on April 10th we had a big relaunch, not a launch, a relaunch of professional learning communities. So, um, and you probably already watched the video from Dr. Rogers about PLCs and the importance and the roles. If you didn't, um, go check the video out. Um, but the, the, the launch of, the relaunch of professional learning communities, and I say relaunch because we've had professional learning communities in some capacity growing a little bit, but this puts a real targeted focus on this work um, so that we really can use it as a tool to drive and move instruction to help improve everything for our students. And the third part relates to developing a comprehensive data tracking system. So our Department of Research Accountability and Assessment plays a big role in this, but what we're looking at is from the time students step into Baltimore County, how do we monitor their, their access and how do we monitor where they are and being identified as college and career ready? So that's pillar three. And then the third challenge that we identify, next slide please, is around pillar two. This is the recruiting and hiring of teachers in critical needs and who are representative of the students who are being served in BCPS. Um, this is you can't have pillar one and pillar two without having teachers and leaders in place. So this is our big one about not only recruiting and hiring, but also retention. And so you see the three strategies that we've teased out. The three strategies are grow our own. The second one is developing a framework to ensure a pool of high quality, diverse teachers, diverse leaders. And then the third one is around engagement about national board certification and us collaborating with MSDE to identify other options that relate to this piece that helps teachers and building teacher leaders. So for pillar three, this is all about our workforce. This is all about the people who will be taking care of our children for early childhood and those who will not only launch them from early childhood, but have them on a path to being college and career ready as we look at pillar three. Next slide. So we had to discuss some of the systemic changes um, that needed to be made in Baltimore County. And one of them was on reflection from last year where 
you know, when we were putting the plan together, it, even though we had groups of people doing different work, it, it, it seemed very siloed. Um, and then writing the plan was sort of reactive, where it was like, you complete this section and you complete this section. And so what we did this year, with the support of our strategic facilitator that's funded through the Accountability and Implementation Board, is develop pillar teams. And so with those right now are central office and school-based staff, and we know that um, we need to grow those teams uh, with some of our stakeholder engagement. Um, and then they, before they began authoring the plan, they, they got together in groups. They did a lot of implementation plan development first. They talked through a problem of practice protocol and really discussed again, those barriers and how will we overcome the barriers for systemic change that needs to happen with the blueprint. With that, they used an equity lens um, and we leveraged the Maryland Association of Board of education framework that is used th throughout our system. And then finally, uh, they have to work through and discuss how are we going to monitor for continuous improvement the work that the pillar teams believe need to happen to make all of this work go forward. One of the things that's also happening is within each pillar team, there's a, a structure that goes all the way through to our chiefs as well as our superintendent. And um, that's really important for us to ensure that the monitoring and accountability um, you know, is held in place. Next slide. Next slide. So this slide here looks at um, the need and the importance of expanding our stakeholder engagement. Um, what we know we did this year and what we did last year as far as um, providing opportunities to um, share about the blueprint and the different pillars and the work um, only hit a few people. And when I say a few people, when we look at some of our different meetings, we did not have crowds and hundreds and hundreds of people. Um, so there, we're sure there's some perspectives out there that we need to tap into and we need to be more mindful of. We know this is work that goes across the divisions. So all the different divisions and offices are engaged in the work, um, but we know we need to look at um, who are we missing and how do we go about missing it. So we're going to build out a comprehensive communication plan in collaboration with the Office of Communications and Community Research, the F Office of Family and Community Engagement, and BCPS TV putting together a strategic communication plan that looks at the various audiences that we need to engage in the work to get feedback, to get them into a feedback loop with us so that not only do we share what's happening, but we get information back so that we can improve and change and adjust our strategies as we need it and adjust the activities. So that's the work of engaging our internal and our external stakeholders because um, we know we'll build it out for not only those in BCPS, but those who have students and are engaged and the community members and the businesses and everybody, um, everybody get engaged. Next, Next slide. slide. <laughs> okay, so where you can find the plan on our uh, website. We did a little shifting around so things might be potentially easier to find. Um, the plan we submitted on March 15th is listed under the 2024 section there. And then our previous plan is listed, the Spanish translated version of it, as well as an executive summary that's translated into multiple languages. Um, then you can click on the resources tab and it will give you other resources that we have listed. And then finally, all the presentations that we did. So it's a little differently organized, but hopefully easy for people to view. And then we'll post our May 1st submission in the 2024 section. And then once it's finalized and all the revisions are done, we'll repost that um, and get it translated. So next slide. Our next steps are to submit the final plan. And then um, what happened last year, which I'm assuming will be similar, is there's a multiple reviews and revisions where we resubmit and um, work through the submission process. Last year it took us um, until it was probably July, end of July, early August, where that final uh, approval came through the Accountability and Implementation Board. And then we're going to be working with our pillar co-leads and their teams to monitor the progress of the things that we put into place as the implementation plan. And finally, that collaboration with the stakeholders, as John, oh, Dr. Staley was just discussing, um, is a part of our next steps. Okay. 
And next slide, we're available uh, for questions and we thank you for your engagement in this process. Okay, thank you, Dr. Staley and Dr. Wistead. It's so refreshing to have two people so passionate about the blueprint <laughs> leading this work. Um, I, I don't think I've ever heard it being presented so enthusiastically. <laughs> we need to get you to the General Assembly and in front of some other school districts. Yes, yeah, so at this time, um, any questions from the board? Uh, Ms. Harvey. Uh, quickly, you, you. Apologies. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, you mentioned um, that facility, facility utilization for the pre-K programs was a challenge and that we were using the space we had available to us and that you were seeking uh, public private partnerships for to expand the program. Can you talk a little bit more about what your ideas are around that? Are we just seeking to partner with other agencies to utilize their space? What? So it, it can be a number of things. Um, obviously a part of the blueprint is that we're required to um, have a certain percentage of private providers. So that is one way we can leverage options for families as well as ensure that all the students are receiving a program. But then yes, we could potentially explore other spaces um, where it could be a lease space idea or something like that. Um, we did receive some good, potential good news very recently that the IAC, yes. I think is right, um, is exploring the uh, projections that we will be presenting to them where typically in the past they went just by seats and actual students. So, um, you know, we don't know exactly what that's going to look like, but I guess they're open to understanding that we are going to be using a projection model. One way that we're hoping to get better projections is uh, through our roundup. So we have uh, worked with our elementary principals and registration um, staff and secretaries to bring through this model for roundup where we're saying bring everyone in, even if we don't have seats for them so we understand what the needs are. Um, and then you're connected with that family so that they come back the next year and maybe it, when the, by the time they're four, we will have space, more private and public options for them. And then definitely we want them back again when they're in kindergarten. So did you want to say other <laughs> things? <laughs> so just to elaborate a little bit on what Dr. Uh, Dr. Wisted uh, was sharing was really as we're looking at how can we support um, the expansion of pre-K, it's we're sort of looking at two different pathways. One is expanding the current offerings within our system. Some of that is through the conversion of half-day pre-K programs into full-day pre-K programs. Um, there is a pre-K expansion grant through MSDE that we are applying for to help facilitate and move that process forward. Um, and certainly the support of Dr. Rogers as pre-K a, a critical area um, is very helpful um, with really just trying to move the work forward. So one is looking at expansion internally. So one, moving half-day programs to full-day programs as well as adding additional full day programs and with regards to the private partnerships really looking at those child care centers or um, preschools that students are attending um, in large volumes and then working directly with those providers to help them understand how they can become accredited with MSD and at the same time they're already serving our students that will be coming to our schools. So really trying to help them understand the process and if there's a way for us to help them navigate it um, because in the end it, it will really be serving our students. Mr. McMillian. Yeah, thanks. Several months ago when we talked about this, we talked specifically about the private provider that might not have the resources to meet these requirements and that there was a possibility there might be some grant money or something out there to help them. Because I'm, I'm looking specifically at Essex and Dundalk that have the providers but might not have, mm -hmm. you know, the, the resources, the wherewithal to expand to help meet our needs as they, as they grow. Well, as Dr. DiDonato said, there is an expansion grant, and so public and private providers are eligible to apply for that grant. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Domanowski. Uh, 
is the like ultimate intention that all pre-K students um, be integrated into an elementary school, be attached with an elementary school? So yes and no, it's that we can provide services to all of them through one of the various mechanisms. So they might not all be in our Baltimore County elementary schools, but they might be attending a private provider who's accredited by MSDE and offers another pre-K preschool option. So it's not necessarily all in our elementary schools because the blueprint outlines um, that it really should be a, a partnership with both private providers and the public school system. But I understand that, but I mean, like, okay. ultimately, um, you know, we can't, we're not, are we all, like, ideally, I guess my, my, I should be asking, is that what, for all of our stu our pre-K students to be in Baltimore County Public Schools would be in an elementary school? Like, our, from, like, K through 5, it would be pre-K through 5 now? So, no, I mean, the blueprint outlines that they want private providers to be critical. So, I'm sorry, I must not be yeah. understanding your question. I just mean, like, uh, so, when we have pre-K students, are with our if we're going to place them in a Baltimore County public school, it will be an elementary school. Maybe. So a uh, majority of the sections that we're opening or all the sections that we're opening, we have plans slated for FY25 are in elementary schools, the expansion that we're having. But one of the um, changes or flexibility that the IAC has brought forward, um, they're allowing school systems to lease spaces where you can have, you know, uh, centers, uh, formal, you know, former uh, daycare centers, but also very much uh, inherent part of their plan. Um, most required part of their plan is that you're also working with the other providers in the area that we're providing them the same training that we're providing our uh, pre-k teachers and so even if a student is not part of West House and elementary school in pre-k that they are in an elementary school preferably in Baltimore County that is teaching the same things and so when they come to kindergarten their level for kindergarten readiness in Baltimore and then we want them in Baltimore County Public Schools their level of re readiness is the same as whether or not you attended one of our programs that we have in one of our um, 110 elementary schools. I think what I'm, I'm trying to get at is that we're going to be putting our, it's pre-K 3, pre-K 4, they're going to be in the same building with our K through 5, ideally. I mean, or they're going to get it somewhere else. But if there is a space in the elementary school, this is where we're going to put. We, we want to put all these pre-K 3 and pre-K 4s in the same building as our K through 5 age students. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So we I want them in school. You want to. Right. But they're going to be their pre-K 3 and pre-K 4 in the same building with kindergartners through fifth graders. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like an example is there where, um, you know, a new school is being built for Scott's Branch. And so ideally, if we can have almost as many rooms for sessions of what kindergarten would be for three year olds and four year olds, that's like an ideal. So we would have enough spaces, not necessarily every three-year-old and four-year-old would go to the homeschool, but that's the feedback we received, um, you know, a few years ago about the idea of uh, families want to go to their neighborhood school, if that's what you're getting at, as opposed to like a center uh, type model. I yeah. don't know. Is that what you're getting at? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right. The next item on the agenda is Academic Achievement Report on Science and Social Studies. And for that, I call on Dr. DiDonato and her staff. Yeah, you got it. I'm okay. going to just intro you guys, and you are all Okay, I'll sit in the middle. No, no, no. I'm not going to We're out of chairs. I'm going to lean over and talk for one minute. We're all in here. Um, we're all teachers. <laughs> we probably uh, yeah. yes. can speak loud enough. So I am going to just stand and to introduce this amazing team here because they do not need me. Um, but we wanted to provide you guys with an opportunity, uh, provide an opportunity to give you an update on all the incredible work that we are doing um, with science and social studies at the elementary and secondary level. And while 
well, I'm not going to take away from the presentation, but what you will see <laughs> is how um, we have really looked at the four priority areas um, and looked at how we are integrating and supporting all of those areas across all of our content. So really making sure that we're providing holistic learning opportunities for our students um, and seeing our key academic areas everywhere. All right. All right. All right. Let's get over. Good evening, everyone. So you can go to the next slide. So we're going to bring the energy level right back up, as you were sharing before. Um, and it's a perfect segue to the presentation you just heard because Blueprint Pillar 3 talks about that establishing the standard for college and career readiness for our students. And we've had an opportunity to come before the board and talk about our plans around literacy and Ms. Shea, you have to talk into the microphone if you can. No one's ever told me I'm not loud enough before oh, and in And it's my stuck life. to the. <laughs> you might just have okay. to switch some seats. Sorry. Okay. Is that better? Yes. That's better. Okay. Yes. Um, so what I was saying was that we're going to bring the energy level up and we're going to talk about how the, thank you, science and social <laughs> studies instruction um, supports the presentation you just heard. So Blueprint Pillar 3 talks about establishing that standard for college and career readiness. And we've had an opportunity to come before the board and share our plans around literacy and around mathematics. And tonight you're going to hear how science and social studies are a critical part of that plan to ensure our students are ready for college and career. The next generation science standards require that students have robust experiences in science beginning at the elementary level. And we know that our social studies instruction requires that students develop as productive citizens contributing to their community. We also have research that supports an inquiry-driven approach to social studies, helps support ELA, and helps their literacy by building that background knowledge and vocabulary. So as you listen to this incredible team from science and social studies, we hope that you will see how both our curriculum and the extra experiences we provide students in both science and social studies are a part of that plan to support college and career readiness. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our science team. OK, good evening. Thank you all for giving us the opportunity to share um, a little bit about what's going on in science in Baltimore County Public Schools. I'm Tiffany Wenland. I'm the secondary science coordinator here. Um, so. Just to give you a little bit of context, about 10 years ago, Maryland adopted the Next Generation Science Standards, or NGSS. Um, we were one of the early adopters, which was fantastic. Um, but what really happened is that science became not about rote memorization of facts. It became much more about figuring things out. So that is our big shift. The science and engineering practices have um, three components. One is, uh, like I said, the science and engineering practices. And that's what scientists and students, we want them to do. And then, of course, there's the traditional disciplinary core ideas, or DCIs. That's the content. That's what we want students to know, and scientists. And then we have the cross-cutting concepts, which were really big, overarching ideas about how we think about science, how we make connections to the real world, how we make things relevant and authentic and rigorous for all of our students. So really shifting from learning, just learning about, into students figuring out and really knowing how to think and, and ways to figure things out is really what we're aiming for. Um, so really briefly, we're going to go over some initial data that we have for the MISA assessment, which is our science MCAT. So I'm going to turn it over to Eric. Thank you. Good evening, members of the board. Uh, I'm Eric Cromwell, coordinator of elementary science. Uh, the, the shift that Tiffany was talking about, I think, uh, Dr. Lichter may remember one of the things I talked about is we've gone from the trivial pursuit model of science to actually having students really do science as part of daily instruction. So it's a major shift for us. So for the three years of comparable data that we've had since the NGSS has come out uh, in fifth grade science, our scores have gone steadily up uh, with regard to the state as well, which is significant and not something that happens statewide. Uh, we came out of COVID and our scores went up. Uh, and having looked at other systems across the state, I think that's a, a pretty high hallmark for us. Um, and also this past year, we had a, 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 another exclamation point on our scores uh, when West Towson was recognized as having the highest science scores in the state. Uh, so that was a, a significant exclamation point on the increases we've seen across the board. Next, please. 
Um, so our secondary science data is um, a little bit less um, informative because we've only gotten one year of data. Um, last year was a baseline for the MESA assessment for biology or life science in the high school. So we are on par with the state, like right there. Um, we also have done some initial research into our curriculum-based assessments, um, specifically just to give you an example for our genetics unit. They're pretty good predictive models of how students are so far performing on the MISA assessment. Next, please. So in addition to what we provide students as part of our normal curriculum, uh, we also provide a number of STEM-related opportunities within and, and outside of the regular school day. Uh, for instance, uh, I know uh, Christina Pumphreys had the opportunity to sit in and be part of our Safe Racer program this past weekend, which was fabulous, our 20th year, believe it or not. So it's part of the heritage of Baltimore County to have this, uh, this program going on, which was absolutely fabulous. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, we have built in really engineering built into the curriculum, uh, such as our blast off program in grade five where students build rockets and launch them and they actually are not entering the rockets as much as they are the chemicals that launch the rockets, as well as our BioBlitz program where students, all fifth grade students get to go into the field with geospatial technologies and collect data in the field. Uh, and as of today, I just checked the numbers, we have collected 78,310 points of data uh, across the county, including three species that have never been identified in Baltimore County previously. So we have kids really doing science. So uh, no one's contested me on this, but we are doing the world's largest uh, data collection project ever been done by 10-year-olds before. <laughs> So in addition to our curricular programs, the extracurricular activities we do also include the Maryland Mesa program, which has been in Maryland for now 40, almost 50 years actually, uh, Green Schools and Physics Olympics, which is another one uh, that's got a deep history in Baltimore County as well. And most recently, you may have seen in the news, uh, the addition of Ripken centers across the system. So we have eight of those and we look forward to adding more across the system in the near future. Thanks, Eric. Um, so one of the things about science and academic, our academic priorities, is these shifts to the next generation science standard really th show an intertwined or integrated approach to science instruction. Um, so we want these all to be integrated simultaneously and implemented simultaneously to our students. So it's not just about discrete facts, like I said before, no rote memorization, but more about the approach to science instruction. So with this, we had three documents that helped to guide our um, development of the curriculum. Um, we had the um, alignment to the Maryland Common Core for ELA. I'm sorry, there's a really long name. Um, I thought he knew the 78,000 number by heart. I was, I was looking. Sorry. Uh, he probably does. Um, but also we have a, a similar document for mathematics. Um, so these actually help to drive our implementation in all the alignments t with the curriculum to ELA, mathematics, and of course always embedded with ESOL and our special education um, Field. Um, so we're going to support this claim with evidence about, because that's what we do in science, um, about how we implement meaningful science instruction. Next, please. Next. <laughs> All right. So we're going to hopefully through the next few slides, like I said, demonstrate how we do connect and support um, literacy, mathematics, um, multilingual learners, and our special education students. So let's start there. Okay, so in NGSS, the mantra is all standards for all students. This is this is how we approach learning in science. This is how we approach all of our students. We want science to be meaningful for all standards and all students, including those with more extensive learning needs. We designed our curriculum purposefully with multiple points of entry that allow for success for all of our students. Our hands-on practices with opportunities for exploration and things to figure out for students, allow students of all abilities to think critically about the world around them and to have relevant, like I said before, and authentic um, applications to Maryland and globally. 
Um, so these hands-on practices are truly exemplified by um, Kristen Powell. She is a teacher at Maiden Choice, and she will be representing the state of Maryland at the Presidential Awards for Excellence in Mathematics and Science Teaching. For short, PAPEST. You know, we love our acronyms. So this is amazing. Um, it, it's a huge honor for us in science as well as for um, Kristen, we're so glad she's representing us. Um, the next um, pillar of our support here, uh, we'll talk about the multilingual learners that we really truly um, have embraced and created additional programming to immerse them in field-based experiences that allow them to build on their cultural knowledge. Um, so for example, in our portable star lab, we have constellations from around the world, okay? So this is what you would see if you're in the Eastern Hemisphere versus the Western Hemisphere, and this is how the sky rotates at night. So that way we build on those cultural foundations. Um, we also, um, again, with our NGSS mantra of all standards for all students, our, our students of, that are multilingual learners excel in those field-based opportunities because they are immersed in touching and feeling and canoeing and, and touching fish maybe for the first time um, out of their comfort zone. Uh, we recognize that many students have differences in culture and linguistic backgrounds than our teachers do, so we are constantly striving to create additional resources in our curriculum that draw on that and build on that wealth of knowledge. Um, we currently, and with the support of the ESOL office last summer, we started building in ESOL study guides for the teachers um, to support our curriculum, especially starting with living systems because that is our tested area. So we're constantly looking for these new instructional strategies and the ones that always work um, that simultaneously promote students learning science and also their English proficiency. Again, turn okay. it over to Eric. Next slide. So the relationship between and support of mathematics and science should not be any surprise. That relationship has been strong and uh, has been going on throughout history. Uh, the big shift with the NGSS, though, is we are really asking students to apply, apply mathematics in real world uh, situations. It's no longer, if those you remember that have been through physics or chemistry, remember the old plug and chug uh, algorithms that we would give students and have them memorize those, we actually require our students to build those with students, or with uh, instruction, uh, but not and not on their own. That's a big shift. So now you got to understand what F equals M A means uh, in a real world, and so we apply that uh, through the real world interactions we have with students, from everything from doing uh, estimating car collisions uh, uh, and the impacts those have to something very simple we do in fifth grade, where we in our unit on Benjamin Banneker we look at sundials where students use protractors to actually build a corrected sundial. Uh, so we are really applying mathematics in meaningful ways to students. Next slide. So as Tiffany alluded to earlier, uh, we make claims supported by evidence in science, which is something that is really important in our world these days. Uh, it's not just enough to say things, you have to have the evidence to support those things. And so this is an area where uh, science, ELA, math, and as you'll hear from my colleagues in social studies, where we all kind of overlap with one another. Um, and so even at the earliest ages, if you advance a little bit there for me, uh, we give you an example of what it looks like in first grade. Uh, we just have a unit right now on birds, we called feather phenomena, and the teachers actually work with students to collect evidence to support the idea that external features of animals have specific purposes and that they do certain things. And we introduce the concept of biomimicry, believe it or not, in grade one. And the students, as they go through and collect this evidence, they support this claim of, of the idea that these external features have value in our world. So if you uh, add to the next slide. In later grades, then, we build on that by having the students write these explanations down. Yes, we do writing in science uh, because uh, you know, if you don't write it down it's not science and so we make sure that these these claims are supported by evidence in, by having students write explanations uh, this continues uh, and if we go back to that first grade one if you advance 
Um, at the end of that specific unit, the students actually make a claim about which bird beak is best suited for picking up small pieces of trash on the playground. So if you hit the video there, please. <laughs> so a claim supported by evidence there. Uh, and then in our, in our higher grades, we take this to another level. We take students into the field and we have them collect data off the bow of a canoe. Uh, and they look for that data to support the evidence they're collecting about the community, about the ecosystem that they're in, and, and how that data can support their claims uh, of improving uh, the ecosystem that they live in. Next slide. Uh, lastly, for my part, before we turn it over to social studies, uh, we actually collaborate with social studies and ELA ahead of the HMH uh, rollout. And what we did was we realigned all of our units uh, to put them in proximity to units related to the topics that we teach in science and social studies. And because this is really supporting the evidence, uh, the research that's come out, that when we provide students with the background to experience science and social studies, this builds that background knowledge, that schema they need to be to increase reading comprehension. And so as we move through this implementation of HMH, uh, we'll be reviewing that and monitoring the implementation to see if there's any further adjustments we need to make on that alignment. So we're very anxious to see that process roll forward. Oh, well, hi, everybody. Good evening. My name is Michael Crispins. I'm the coordinator of elementary social studies. And I'm so excited to speak with you all tonight about social studies. It is my favorite thing in the entire world. Uh, so uh, let's start by just talking a little bit about the alignment that social studies has with the system priorities. As you guys already know, social studies complements the work in English language arts quite a bit. It's built in everything we do, the disciplinary literacy skills that we discuss on a daily basis in social studies complement what's done in ELE classrooms across the board um, quite frequently. The, we also use something called the DBQ project, and you're going to see it a lot tonight. It is kind of the cornerstone of what we do, uh, but it allows students to interact with materials, engage in source analysis that, for example, support mathematics. So they'll practice numerical sources, uh, charts, tables, graphs, so, so forth, to analyze those documents and then use the data that's within them to respond to a compelling question in a written response. Lastly, we and Dr. B and Coley and I will both share, we continue to build supports into our curricula uh, to support ESOL students as well as our special ed populations. Next slide, please. Elementary social studies is built on an expanding horizons uh, mindset. That means that in our primary grades, K through three, our students are engaged in thematic based units around civics, social study, I'm sorry, civics, history, um, Oh my gosh, uh, geography and economics, my apologies. Um, and within those themes, it's all from a local lens. In grades four and five, we expand a little bit more and we look at a chronological approach to history through uh, the origins of the United States. Now, as you may know, um, as Eric already alluded to, we've worked with ELA to complement what's going on in HMH. Uh, that work is ongoing and it continues to happen. And one of the things we're really excited about is that there are future integration opportunities for integrated units of study between social studies and ELA. Uh, we're highlighting one this summer around grade one with some map skills and geography skills that they're doing in ELA to take some of the burden off of teachers. Now, social studies as well is a little bit different than probably what many of us experience as students in classes. It's, uh, we've already heard this a little bit, but it's not the rote memorization of skills anymore. We're not preparing students to be successful in a game show. It's really about allowing students to engage in thoughtful discourse around compelling questions and then using evidence to support that information that they have and build and communicate their conclusions about uh, everything that they, they find. There's lots of research that supports this work, whether it's the RAND study, uh, the Fordham study, the science of reading, they all speak to the interconnectedness of background knowledge to that developing of, of literacy. Um, and of course, as I already shared, the DBQ project is an amazing resource, and I'm gonna share a whole lot about it. Uh, but it's all about inquiry-driven qu questions where students evaluate sources, draw conclusions, and then respond to that. I could speak all day about the DBQ project, you but really I'd rather, could. I really, really could, uh, but I'd rather let a few students, when you ask them about the DBQ project, uh, here's what some of them would have responded with. Hi, my name is Paris, and I am a fifth grade student at Pine Elementary. Hi, I'm also a fifth grade student at Pine Elementary, and my name is Anna. <laughs> we were in this flash pool, this fourth grade class last year, and we were asked to do a DBQ recommendation. 
Well, what is a DBQ? A DBQ is a document-based question resource that helps you engage in researching, <laughs> researching about a topic. How, do, how does the DBQ project help you become a better writer? I think that the DBQ project helps me become a better writer because it gives you a format and really good documents and evidence which are real f that provide real facts and the topics are always engaging and interesting for the student. DBQ helped me break up the paragraphs so I could write them neater and better. I like the DBQ format because it's easy to gather information to put into your essay. I like DBQ because it organizes, because like the buckets, they help me organize my evidence. I like DBQ because, because it makes it a lot easier to build essays by like, it gives you a bunch of small questions and then you put them all together and then you get a big essay. Uh, I enjoyed doing the DBQ project because it had a lot of fun information and the documents really helped me build uh, my essay to be a lot better than it, what it could have been. I became a better writer because the essay builder helped me to like, have better sentences and paragraphs that were longer and had more information. Um, I would, I would recommend the DBQ to another student or class because the essay builder and all the documents and all the information that it had to help me do an essay and get a good grade. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. I sure do love our kids. Uh, the discipline-specific skills that are associated with the DBQ project are heavily embedded in the skills of a, a social scientist. They talk about corroboration, causation, contextualization, and of course, sourcing. Um, and as you heard from the students, it's not just a home run for students, it's also a home run for teachers. The DBQ project is a full uh, curriculum package that includes everything a teacher needs to be a successful teacher facilitator in their classroom. Above and beyond that, it provides differentiated materials that support all learners in their classroom. There's Spanish versions available for every single student-facing document, and there's a human reader available for every single student-facing document, including the Spanish ones. Now, if that's not enough, uh, it also has digital annotations that allow students to practice the skills that they're going to continue to practice with high stakes assessments throughout. So they're continuing to build not just their writing skills, uh, but their ability to interact with text digitally, and it's been a really great resource. So what does this mean for achievement? Next slide. What this means is that we're seeing some positive things in our classrooms, uh, and that's associated with a variety of data points. The first and foremost is usage. If you look at the graph on the left-hand side, you'll notice that our elementary usage has grown to more than 130,000 individual sign-ons by our grade, just grade four and five students uh, through middle of March this year. And while that's great, data is wonderful to have and usage is great, um, what does that mean for actual achievement? The, chart on the right showcases just a sampling of five schools and how they performed on the grade two unit, or excuse me, the grade five unit two CBA uh, from last year to this year in the growth. And you can see in that first column, they've seen some pretty tremendous growth. Uh, and we've seen that growth across a majority of our schools and almost ac actually across all demographic groups. The second column in that chart represents the number of, or excuse me, the percentage of fifth graders that are actively using the resource. So for example, in school two, you'll notice that 100% of their fifth graders are using the resource, which is wonderful. That's exactly what we'd like to see. The third column is related to uh, their individual usage. That number is going to vary school to school for a variety of reasons, one of which, for example, might be the length of a social studies class period. For example, if they have class 45 minutes a day, uh, they might have to interact with the resource more than if somebody has an hour a day. They might not need to go into the resource as much. So we might see a lower usage number. So that's just one piece of this. Um, and while we're all seeing this positive gain in social study CBAs, we're also starting to see trends that this is uh, dribbling over into our CBAs in English language arts. Uh, so we have some promising trends, but we're gonna be working with the RAA to explore them just a bit more uh, to make sure that we have more authentic data that we could provide to that. Next slide, please. 
the Office of Social Studies also provides a whole lot of extracurricular activities. And instead of just highlighting uh, all of them, I chose just two. Uh, so the first is black excellence. Uh, some of you may be experienced with the Black Saga program that Baltimore County had a long time ago. It was a fact-based competition where students had to get on stage and work in teams of three to answer 10 questions. Uh, that wasn't terribly inclusive. We wanted to build a more inclusive experience for our students, so we worked with stakeholders to build the Black Excellence program. So this more inclusive experience allows students to engage in any of three different components of the program. One is a book study, two is a fact-based competition, because they just insisted they had to have it, and three is an independent research project. So students can participate in any one or all three components of that program. This year we had more than 300 students from more than 25 different elementary and middle schools participate, and on February 24th we had students share their community research, or excuse me, their research in a, a community-wide event uh, at Perry Hall High School. It was a fabulous event, and hopefully we'll be able to get some more folks to come next year. Um, the second piece that's on that slide is around Junior Achievement of Central Maryland. This collaboration has been uh, multifaceted because it's uh, inner office collaboration between the Office of Social Studies and the Office of CTE as we work to support Pillar 3, College and Career Readiness. Um, but in addition, it's also supporting our initiative around financial literacy. So Junior Achievement of Central Maryland allows our students to have a safe experience to learn and apply financial literacy skills in two different simulation experiences. That'd be JA BizTown and JA Finance Park. This year, we've been able to welcome 5,400 different students from 45 different elementary and middle schools to that experience, and this is a pilot year, so next year we're expecting that number to dramatically rise. Uh, so that was a little snip about our elementary program, and I'm gonna pitch it over to Dr. Biancoli for our secondary experience. Hi, good evening. I'm Danny Biancoli. I'm the coordinator of secondary social studies, and I'm not gonna retread a whole bunch of things that Mr. Crispin's already talked about. Um, you've heard numerous times that we're shifting social studies from the Jeopardy model to an inquiry-driven model. Um, and with that in mind and thinking of the work that we do to support literacy every day, I would ask you, what do some of these questions have in common? You know, Hammurabi's code, was it just? How did the Constitution guard against tyranny? I'll tell you, one is that there is no right or wrong answer to these questions. And second is these are the type of questions that we are asking our students in grades 6 through 12 to wrestle with on a daily basis. So as we make this shift to become more inquiry driven and to move away from memorization of fact and towards application, we're asking our students to wrestle with increasingly complex historical or current questions. Students interrogate a wide variety of sources in order to build that evidence-based argument. Whether it's done in a class discussion or in writing, they're working in that literacy rich environment to become critical consumers of information. Next slide. And you've heard a lot about the DBQ project. <laughs> so the DBQ project first came to Baltimore County in 2018 um, in the secondary world. And I think the fact I didn't hear Ms. Mr. Crispin say was that we are the number one user in the world of the DBQ project. <laughs> Um, because it has become so integral to our curriculum as we make that shift. I promise it is also not the only thing we use in social studies. We just really like it, and it's a great way for teachers and students to have curated uh, resources available to them. Um, one of the good things to come out of the virtual instruction in the pandemic was the fact that we were able to shift to the online platform, which provided a wide variety of resources to make the DBQ accessible to all students. Um, currently, all of our students in grades 6 through 12 are expected to do one full DBQ per unit each year. The DBQ online platform provides a variety of annotation tools and supports that Mr. Crispins has already talked about um, that help make this accessible to all of our students. That includes our special ed students, that includes our multilingual learners, that includes our advanced academic students. Um, in addition to this, um, in the secondary world, we have worked with um, the Office of ESAW last summer to begin to build a scaffolded supplement to our American government curriculum. Um, in social studies, that is our tested area, and our students need to take the end of course MCAP assessment in order to earn their American government credit. Um, so we want to eliminate barriers to graduation by providing supports and scaffolds to help those students be successful. Um, it's work that we hope to continue in both government and in other subjects as we continue to work in partnership with that office. Uh, next slide. Um, in terms of data, 
last year was the first year that we administered the grade eight social studies MCAP. And so while the DBQ project has been in our program since 2018, um, we don't have a lot of data in terms of its impact on MCAP. But we have seen is that schools with 72% usage or better have scored on average nine points higher than the BCPS average. Um, as we begin to have more data sets, as more and more students are taking those assessments, we're gonna continue to work with DRAA to that correlation continues. Um, it was very positive for this first year, so we have high hopes that that will continue. Next slide. And just to wrap up, Mr. Christmas was not wrong when he said we have a lot of programming in the social studies office. Um, whether it is sending students to the Maryland General Assembly each year to act as pages during the annual legislative session, or it's sending this year 300 students to participate in the annual Model UN program. Um, that's in its 20th year in partnership with Towson University, um, and it's a phenomenal program if you've never seen it, Please let us know. We'd love to have you there next year to see students acting sometimes. Um, they're acting like the General Assembly. It's amazing. <laughs> it is absolutely amazing to see these kids uh, embrace that role. Um, we also coordinate the mock trial program for the third judicial circuit, which includes public and private schools in both Baltimore and Hartford counties. Um, we co-sponsor the annual Black History Month essay contest with the Office of English Language Arts, and that is drawing an increasing number of student entries every year. The other thing that we do is we work with local organizations to increase our voter registration and voter education programs. Um, it's our goal to help all of our students learn how they can exercise their voice. In that same way, our students in grades eight and nine work with Project Soapbox and My Impact Challenge, um, where they earn their student service learning hours, but they also learn how to advocate for local issues that they're passionate about. Um, and while we do have a lot of programming, we are always looking for more ways to engage our students. Um, thank you, and we're gonna wrap that up. So I'm sure you can agree. We have a passionate team that brought the energy right back up. And hopefully you heard lots of ways that our curriculum design, as well as those experience, support our students uh, with developing a love for science and social studies, but also preparing for that readiness for college and career. So with that, we'll take any questions. Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. This was um, very informative, and it just shows the great work that's happening in Baltimore County Public Schools. Um, questions from the board. Ms. Pumphrey. I just have a comment. Um, just thank you so much for this amazing presentation. Your excitement is obvious and evident. Um, but I also have to shout out for Safe Racer, the competition. It was amazing. <laughs> um, I enjoyed it. I brought my 17-year-old daughter. She enjoyed it. She remembered doing that in third grade. And just to know that this is part of our third grade curriculum and that students are hands-on learning science and enjoying it and have, having fun, it just it was amazing to me. So thank you for that. Yeah, that was the neat part about setting up. It, so we had our competition at Carver. And uh, as we were setting up, the signage was going up. Up, and as the Carver students were going through, all of them were going, oh, I remember doing that. It's with the egg, and we got to, ours broke, and we didn't win, but it was a great time. And it, it, it was universal. So thank you for, for attending and supporting that. Any other questions? Ms. Frimpong. So thank you for this presentation. It's exciting, the different work that's being done. And just again, that idea of really um, talking to students about how we think, how do we you know, give rash or rationalize what it is that we're saying and give supports for that. So I think that's a fantastic thing. Um, on the flip side of that, I do see like, for example, from slide four, where we talked about with MISA and our progress and our, um, comparison to BCPS versus the state, right? So we're making that progress and we're continuing to improve, but then yet we're still below the state. So I guess what are some of some of your thoughts or approaches that you're thinking, how do we get to that point where we're gonna be at the state or above? And then even is there some challenges because with these state testings, it's not always about being able to rationalize, right? It's just this is right or this is wrong if it's a multiple choice type of question. 
Well, and to that, the so our the test isn't necessarily just always about right or wrong because we have written responses students are expected to do too, and they are, they are very open-ended responses. We've seen the release items for those, so we have a sense of what they what those items look like. Now, obviously, we haven't seen the ones that are you know part of the controlled testing, but we do have a sense of what those are. So we do provide professional development on range finding for teachers, uh, so they get a sense of what the expectations are based on the state rubrics. So they become and can help students better tune the writing, which we know is a weakness for our students and something we're definitely working towards. Okay, thank you. Ms. Harvey. Thank you, Thank you all for your enthusiasm about social studies, which is one of my personal favorites. <laughs> so uh, I have a question about the DBQ usage uh, slide. So you've uh, noted that schools that have a 72% usage perform higher uh, on the MCAP SSA uh, testing. So what determines usage by school? So in terms of the online platform, that's the best way we track usage. So as students log into the platform via Schoology, it actually tracks that and we're able to export that data and take a look at individual students, individual classes, teachers, and schools. And we're able to kind of go in and see how frequently students are interacting with the materials, with the program. And then we're able to take that and kind of do the math with the enrollment in the courses in the schools. So are you in the data, uh, have you disaggregated the data, and are you finding any patterns in terms of which schools, which regions, which students, which teachers, in terms of you know, season tenured, new, in between, are using this less than uh, the 72%? So we do have um, some of our schools are very attached to their paper-based uh, approach to the DBQ. And so we are trying very hard to encourage them to work with the online platform because of the variety of supports and scaffolds it provides. So that's one hole in our data that it's really hard for us currently to find a good way to account for the paper-based version. So that's something we've been having conversations with internally as well as with DBQ about how can we go about making sure we're capturing that um, because it is a at least in the secondary uh, world it is written into our curriculum so obviously it is the expectation that our teachers are doing this it's just hard currently to capture perfect data because we're, we're really trying to pry the paper away from uh, folks and saying it's better for kids it does a better job of preparing them for the online testing environment that they're going to be in um, and we don't want to do anything that is going to be detrimental and so trying to convince them that they can give up the paper and they can move to that so that it, we do have a way to track that. Um, we're also in the process of creating uh, district level rubrics that will allow us to also track performance and student achievement and improvement. Um, and that's something we're working towards right now. If I can just quickly add to, um, this is where we also partner with the Department of Schools. We work really closely to share that data when you talked about school by school usage and some of the patterns since they work so closely with the principals and their leadership teams, they're able to give us information about where there might be a more novice teacher staff or where there is a change in leadership so that together we partner to identify those next steps for professional learning so that we can prioritize schools um, to understand more about what they need in terms of support to increase that usage. So it, I would think it would be important to even to your point determine which schools, are there even patterns in schools that are clinging to paper rather than uh, using uh, the electronic system and are the schools that are using paper, are they in this, this percentage of schools that are performing better? Is, is one more effective uh, than the other? I think particularly from a, a uh, when we're trying to raise the expectation in academic achievement and we have a tool that at least uh, correlates to better performance, that it's important that we make sure that each student uh, is receiving that instruction to the highest fidelity. Absolutely. Board member Harvey, uh, thank you uh, for that point, and we're in agreement. One of the things that we found throughout the year as we continue to review the data um, is there is 
a strong attachment to paper. Um, we see this not only in DBQs, but we also see this in curriculum-based assessments. When we have had opportunity to work with principals, to talk to department chairs about some of the rationale and reasoning behind that, that helps us, uh, gives us some feedback that we have to go back and look at our timelines to make sure that our timelines are well spaced out and they're reasonable in terms of when we're expecting people um, to access certain tools and certain windows. Now I'm speaking about the CBA as well as the uh, DBQs. So then when we're extracting the information, we have total and complete information. And so we have been very um, forthright with our uh, principals and teachers about our expectations. And in part of our work to establish more coherence across the system, um, that's something that we're going to look to see a lot more of. And with the exceptions being students that have um, specific accommodations uh, to use paper where it would mimic the environment in terms of how they're going to be assessed by the state, as well as transition periods, particular grades where we're introducing something very new at different ages to our students, but really making that uh, commitment as a part of this summer professional learning kickoff that we're having for all teachers across Team BCPS and the paraprofessionals to really reset expectations, but also to equip teachers and paraprofessionals with the skills that they need to implement this with fidelity and at a high level so that they feel confident stepping away from the paper and reassuring them that the technology is not going to crash on them as it does not crash during state assessment. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Ms. Lichter. Um, yes, thank you again for the presentation and the data points, but I think especially the data points that talked about how it's influencing ELA achievement. So to hear that and to even look for that um, is really good so that just know that it's transferring and the kids were talking about their writing. So while you're asking them about a social studies yes. or um, curriculum, they were responding with how improved they thought their writing was. So I think that crossing the different content areas is huge. Um, and to see the success in the data and to see, hear the kids talk about it is a real advantage. So um, I'd like to hear more about that as we um, continue usage of it. And also, the I was fortunate enough to go to the Woodlawn Curriculum Night and went over to um, your table and got to see those materials. So for any of the viewing public who wants to see what this DBQ is talking about, there's one more coming up on April, April 30th, 30th at Delaney. At Delaney High School. Right. I, I knew that. But anyway, but thank, <laughs> thank you, And everybody. we will be there with it. Thanks for your prompting. <laughs> but um, you'll be able to see what they're actually talking about. And they are wonderful materials. So thanks. Thank you. Now, I just have three questions, two for science, one for social studies. Um, so for science, what is contributing to the success of West Towson um, and, and their outperformance of the state on science assessments? So in one, so one particular instance is they have longevity of their staff. Uh, they haven't had a lot of staff turnover, so, and the teacher there uh, was pretty close to being a PAMSET winner this year as well. Uh, so she's got a long track record, uh, as well as their other staff in that school. Um, they just don't have the teacher turnover, and that's contributed a lot to continuity of instruction across the multiple years with the students in the building. Good. And then the second question is just around the standards that are posing challenges to students. Um, just in a future presentation, um, if we could just have the standards where the students are struggling and kind of what you all are doing to address that, uh, that struggle that students may be having. Well, I'll speak to the elementary side a little bit. Uh, many times it's the physical science standards, the ones that have, that are a bit more complex. Not complex, but abstract, I think, is, is the better term for students because it's hard to see atomic structures sometimes and interact with them on a, in a real world basis. We get into that a little bit with chemistry when they can see the interactions. Uh, and don't tell anybody, but it's baking soda and vinegar that they mix to launch their rockets with, by and large. Every once in a while, they, they do choose baking powder Powder, which also works, but uh, they, um, but it's sometimes it's those concepts. Genetics is another one where they struggle because again, it's like in some cases that deep time idea of how things change over time is hard for students to understand. Yes. Tiffany, do you have any one for high school? It's it continues through. Um, physical sciences is hard for students, um, and that is why it is so important to have the students 
do the figuring out and do the hands-on explorations on their own with lots of resources and opportunities to do those things. So um, yes, we, we do. Uh, of course, we look at the data in high school um, our data is only around life science. That's the state assessment has moved only to life science. So that's more we, we look at specific data from the state um, for middle school. Um, but then we use our CBA data for all, all of our high school courses as well. well. I just want to commend you all on the strength of your science program just as a parent the amount of work that my child has to do in science and the amount of work that I have to do. Um, well, come on, I, they have a leg up. I, mean, um, I appreciate, yes. You so, are a science friend. I, I, do I know love that. science, but I'm like, I have homework? How did that happen? But it is really a strong program here in Baltimore County and, um, and really is commendable. Thank you. And that even leads me to social studies, because once again, as a parent, there are so many opportunities for students. You talked about junior achievement and mock trial and, and all the different things that, um, that support the social studies content. How are you ensuring that all students have access to it? Because I think about something like junior achievement, there's a limited number of spaces, um, with biz town and, and all that. So how are you ensuring that you know throughout the course of a student's continuum in Baltimore County Public Schools that they at least least have some experience with one of these wonderful offerings that you've identified? Uh, that's a great question. I, I'll speak to the junior achievement piece, Matt. Um, so junior achievement, we've collaborated with them to allow all of our students to oh. attend that experience. So every seventh grader um, is attending JA Finance Park next year. Um, that's the expectation. This year, and actually, as we move into next year, they do have some facility requirements um, because of just size. Uh, we're only able to get about 50% of our schools in. So for example, next year, we're going to be sending fourth grade students into junior achievement. And then the following year, any school that did not attend at the fourth grade year, they will be sending their fifth grade students. That way, all of, that, all of those students get that experience. And I would say for some of our secondary programs, um, one of the things that we did with the mock trial program is we actually worked with one of the retired judges from the circuit court to help identify um, attorney volunteers to help us um, and to help strengthen the programs in some of our schools that might not have parent volunteers uh, who are attorneys. And so it really has increased the number of schools that are participating um, and the students have just done a phenomenal job in terms of their growth um, by having that um, that attorney volunteer to help them. Thanks. Mr. Lusky, you had a question. Thank you all for your enthusiastic presentation. Um, just want to piggyback a little bit on um, what was asked in terms of the, the clubs and the offerings. Is there any um, tracking of like equity of access. So for example, with Mo Model UN or Mock Trial, the number of high schools that participate, the ability for a neighboring school student to come over to a neighboring school to participate, um, just to improve equity of access. Right. And then so, I have one other question. Okay, so we absolutely kind of track our participation, our schools that are participating. We're always looking for uh, new schools to bring on board. A lot of that depends on having teachers who are willing to volunteer, um, or depending on the program, whether it's an EDA or whether it's something that is just purely a volunteer program. So that's one limiting factor. Um, I honestly can't say if we've talked about having students come um, after school from a different school to participate. I think a lot of times transportation can become a problem with that, but that's definitely something we could look into in places where we have interested students but not uh, a faculty member currently on board. Thank you. And then my second question, in terms of the DBQ I, moving to the online platform, and I thank Dr. Rogers for speaking to students that need the paper copy. Um, so as you encourage teachers to move to the online platform, what are you doing to just also ensure that paper copies are always available for either students who need them from a 
IEP or 504 standpoint or for students who just prefer highlighting on a paper copy. Thank you. <laughs> so actually, two different things. Uh, first, all of our schools have complete paper binder sets. So there's always clean paper versions of everything available to them. Um, so that's, that's sort of one way that we make sure that they're in the building, that they're accessible. Um, the other piece, we actually talk to teachers about using a hybrid. So as we're moving to try to encourage teachers to use the online platform, because again, it mimics the environment they would have in the state test, but to say to them, okay, so how can we take this and break this to pe into pieces? Maybe the first thing we do is we say, give the students the documents on paper. Have them do the highlighting and the annotation in front of them on paper, as opposed to using those same tools digitally. But then ask them to write that final product on the online platform so that we're moving in small steps that become more accessible to students. Or to have them have both, because if you have a student who might need a reader, having it in front of them on paper, but then also having the computer human reader um, available to them is just a great way, again, of eliminating barriers to understanding. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next, the next item on the agenda is board member comments, committee updates, and agenda setting. We will start with committee updates. Um, for the audit committee, Mr. McMillian. Thank you. The audit committee met on April 9th, and we discussed the following topics. Software as a solution, and that's referred to as the SAAS audit report. The FY24 quarter three audit work plan update and the FY24 quarter three investigations update. We also tabled the discussion on the purpose and role of the committees until our next meeting, and our, and our next meeting will be on Monday, May 20th, 2024 at 4.30. And those audits I just mentioned, all of those reports are posted to the Office of Internal Audit website. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. And I'm going to actually jump back because I forgot one agenda item. So the next item on the agenda is information. The first item is the FY24 general fund report on revenues, expenditures, and encumbrances, budget, and actual for the period ending February 2024. The next item is the February meeting minutes of the Southeast Area Advisory Southeast Area Education Advisory Council. And the last item is an update on key school legislation that have been introduced and presented during the, during the session. Now the next item on the agenda is um, board, board member comments, committee updates, and agenda settings. So um, we've already started with Mr. McMillian with the audit committee, and now we'll move to the budget committee um, led by Ms. Dominowski. Yes, um, the budget media committee Budget Committee met um, on Wednesday, April 10th, and we did discuss our Board of Fef Effectiveness and Purpose, and um, we agreed on a document which will be presented at our next uh, board meeting. Uh, we will meet again on um, May 15th, Wednesday, May 15th at 5.30 virtually. Thank you. Building and Contracts, Ms. Harvey. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Building and Contracts Committee met yesterday. We began our discussion on the purpose of the committee and our measures of effectiveness, and we'll continue and finalize that discussion at our next meeting, which will be on Monday, May 6th at 5 p.m. virtually. Thank you. Thank you. Curriculum Committee, Ms. Lichter. Yes, um, our meeting is actually tomorrow. Um, whatever, tomorrow, April 17th. Um, we have two items on our agenda. We actually are finishing from our last meeting. One is the ESOL curricula, assessments and materials of instruction um, for grades six through 12, and then the textbook and anthologies for English courses, also grades six through 12. We will also begin our discussion on the purpose of the curriculum committee and our meeting and our measures of effectiveness. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, equity Committee is Dr. Savoy. She, it's not here, but um, Ms. Teleski will provide the update. Okay, thank you. So um, the equity meeting uh, met on Thursday, April 11th. At our next meeting, which is on May 16th at 4 o'clock, we will also be discussing the committee's effective evaluation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next committee is the Legislative and Governmental Relations Committee. And for that, I, I'll call on myself. 
And I am excited to announce that the, you know, we are officially done with the legislative season. <laughs> so thank you, uh, Ms. Charlie Green, Mr. Bazemore, and Ms. Senior for supporting the legislative committee through this session. Um, during this legislative session, the, the committee was very active. We developed legislative priorities that were approved by the board. We provided testimony in support of two bills that have passed. So I am excited to say that um, the first bill House Bill 108 and Senate Bill 0451 um, that revises the compensation for the student board member scholarship and board member com compensation um, was passed. And I thank the Baltimore County delegation, um, the Senators Brooks and Hedelman uh, for supporting this bill and um, really seeing it through to the end and bringing the compensation to, to right size it for um, board members and to um, really help to support uh, the, the student member um, with the scholarship for the um, for school. And the second bill was around the um, Baltimore County School Nominating Commission, and it increases transparency of this process. And so I um, just want to thank uh, Senator Sidnor and, um, and the Baltimore County delegation for, for moving this bill through. We have also, um, we provided some testimony in support of this so that now the community will know who has been nominated. Um, and it just greatly increases transparency um, for the board. So this really gets back to those systems and structures that I talked about earlier and how we can really help to move things forward in our schools, school system um, in an equitable way to increase transparency um, and to ensure that we are right-sizing what we do with um, the rest of the nation. And so, um, and then also what you'll see is a link to the MABE Legislative Committee and um, at that committee they did at the April 15th meeting, if you select that link and you select the summaries, the session summary presentation for April 15th, there is a summary of all the bills that impact education um, that we would need to also consider um, as a board with some of our decisions. Um, so it's a great presentation of the bills that, that passed and the ones that failed. So I do encourage um, board members and the general public to review that so that you know where we're going with education. And the next um, committee, policy review committee, Ms. Pumphrey. Thank you. Um, PRC did not have an April meeting, however, we did discuss our committee purposes and measures of effectiveness at our March 11th meeting. Um, our next scheduled meeting is May 13th, and I also wanted to mention that we received several emails regarding policy 1280, um, and policy 1280 is tentatively on the agenda for the June 12th policy review committee meeting, and the policy is tentatively scheduled to be presented to the full board at the August 13th, 2024 board meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Next is board member comments and agenda items. Board members, please raise your hand to indicate if you have any comments or items for consideration. Ms. Lichter. Um, just a comment. I was um, asked by um, Ms. Dupac, who is sitting in the office, um, office audience and has stayed the whole meeting, to talk to her about the role of the board. Um, and when I met with her, I learned something new, and she is part of the Aspire program. So we talk a lot about professional development for our staff and our um, teachers and principals, but I learned that there is a whole professional development strand for our um, other staff that don't um, fall into that category, and I'm just going to read what it says so I don't botch it up, that the goal of Aspire BCPS is to provide a variety of professional development experiences that build the personal and professional skills, abilities, and leadership capacity of staff members seeking growth, change, or career advancement within BCPS. So her coming here and reaching out to me was to learn more about an aspect of the system that she um, did not have a lot of experience, but I want to commend her, first of all, for staying the whole time. This was a long meeting, so thank you. Um, but also to our office, I know um, Dr. Burquist, um, part of that, and providing this type of professional development to all of our staff members is huge, um, and I just wanted to um, give a shout out for that, so thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lichter. Any other board members? Okay. The last item on the agenda is announcements. The board's next meeting will be held on Tuesday, May 7, 2024 at 6.30 p.m. Thank you for joining us tonight and have a great Thank you for joining us tonight. The meeting <laughs> the is, is now adjourned. <laughs>